This is the August 24th, 1999 meeting of the uh, Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals. And uh, before we launch into the normal agenda, I've got a few uh, announcements I need to make. Uh, for anyone that may be here for the matter that's on the agenda under new business involving Wayne and Beverly Brooking, 208 Two Lights Road, that application has been withdrawn. And uh, you're welcome if you're here for that to stay for the entertainment, but otherwise you may want to go home and watch television or the sunset. Uh, I also want to uh, just acknowledge uh, David Backer, who's in the audience uh, in the middle of the room here, and who has been nominated uh, to be an, uh, another member of the zoning board to replace a vacancy. Uh, and unfortunately, the town council hasn't had a chance to meet yet, among other things, to confirm that. So Mr. Backer's sitting in the audience instead of at the table. <clears throat> so for that reason, we have uh, five members with one absentee tonight uh, in addition to the vacancy. And uh, it should be noted that for variances, it uh, takes four votes uh, to pass a variance. Uh, the other thing I want to do is acknowledge uh, that uh, Alice Allen, who has been the secretary for this board and on television and off and everything for 10 years, as well as the secretary for the planning board, uh, retired and uh, is moving on to a new phase of her life and is no longer with us, which is hard to believe, but it's true. And uh, she will be missed, but I'm sure will be ably replaced by Lisa Young, who, uh, excuse me, Leslie Young, who uh, is uh, going to take over that task and uh, provide us with excellent minutes to refer to when we need to in the future. Um, and I guess that's it. So as that would lead in, let's look at the minutes from uh, July 27th and uh, ask if there are any corrections to those minutes. Oh, I can't find my copy. <clears throat> Anybody see any problems with the minutes? Bruce? Yeah, just a couple. Just a spelling uh, on page three, second paragraph from the bottom, third line, concerns. I'm sorry, say again where you are? Second paragraph from the bottom, third mm -hmm. line down, right in the center. Uh, oh, okay. I think that's supposed to be concerns. Uh -huh. And then on page four, third paragraph, um, he said no one could argue the present structure of 927 square feet is an adequate home. Is, is, is that correct? Is that a correct statement? I, I, just think it, I think it was, yes. Okay. It's consistent with the discussion, I remember. That's all I have. Okay. Anybody else? If not, uh, I move we accept the minutes as Thank uh, you. For a second. directed. All those in favor of the motion to approve the minutes for uh, July 27th. Is anybody opposed? I see none. Uh, Alice, if you're watching, you went out in style. Uh, and let the record note that Tom Laprod arrived and uh, we're now up to our full complement. We record my apologies for my tardiness as well. <laughs> no problem. We're just starting. Uh, the next item of business then is uh, one that's uh, been on our agenda twice already and uh, is up again for discussion tonight, and that is the request of Mary Page, 172 Two Lights Road, tax map U15, lot 5, for a front property line, Beacon Lane, variance of 24 feet from the required 30, and a front property line on Two Lights Road variance of 12 feet from the required 30 to construct additions to the existing single family dwelling. Uh, before we get into that case, I need to draw everyone's attention to other items that are already in our packet. Uh, as I said, this has been on our agenda twice, so there have been 
uh, statements by attorneys. There have been letters flying back and forth in the time since the last meeting. And uh, I want to note them for the record before we even get started. Uh, these include a uh, letter to Mike Hill from uh, our code enforcement officer sending the materials that uh, were generated at the last meeting uh, to the town attorney for review. That letter was dated July 29th. And uh, in that letter, Mr. Smith asked uh, Mike Hill for uh, comments on several issues. And uh, Mr. Hill responded to that letter on August 18th and included a lengthy attachment of a variety of court cases uh, that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that relate to the uh, issues that we were discussing uh, and were very helpful to me and uh, I think and hope to the other members. Uh, there's also a letter to Mr. Hill, uh, let me get the right date on this one, uh, dated July 30th from David Lurie, uh, asserting some of his positions on this case, and uh, a letter dated August 6th. Um, I might point out, by the way, that Mr. Lurie represented uh, the Lakemans who live in the area and opposed the application. A uh, letter dated August 6th from uh, Attorney Michael Traster, who represented the, the uh, Page uh, application at the last meeting, and he wrote a letter to Mr. Hill on that date, uh, setting forth his key points. And uh, uh, then again, another letter dated the 16th, uh, attaching a letter from real estate broker Aaron Grady Gallant, uh, which was dated. August 11th, and which referred to uh, the likely increase in property values or impact on property values from either reconstructing or not reconstructing the page home. And then Mr. Lurie wrote again on August 15th to Mr. Hill, excuse me, to the Board of Appeals, uh, presumably through Mr. Smith, uh, and uh, in effect, summarizing his own uh, positions and uh, indicating that he would not be at this meeting. Um, then we had several uh, petitions, in effect, supporting the proposal from the pages signed by David uh, Heward, I guess it is, and Margarita Heward uh, from Beacon Lane, 10 Beacon Lane, and another from Corinne York and Francis York, uh, Doyle from 16 Beacon Lane. Um, well, I think I've gotten them all there. I hope I have. Uh, so with all those noted for the record uh, and available to anyone that wants to look at any of these, you're welcome to come on up and I'll be glad to give you my copies of anything. Uh, let's Mr. move into this item. We need to get it off the table first. Mr. Chair, yeah. uh, we do have some communications or some uh, petitions signed by neighbors and or abutters to the community of uh, the pages. Um, is there anything else that, that went or that goes along with their um, petition? Um, it reads, we, the community of the Tulites area of Cape Elizabeth, Maine, agree with the renovations and upgrades being done to the property at 172 Tulites Road. The property has been in disrepair for a number of years, and the current owners, Ron and Mary Page, are planning to totally renovate the house, house and land and use it as their primary residence. The renovations include, include plans for a single-family home with a total cleanup of the lot. We have seen the plans and agree to the variance should uh, and agree that the variance should be granted. Now, we have seen a couple of plans, and I'm wondering which ones the community have seen, whether it's the new one that's going to be before us this evening or whether it's the old one. 
I don't know, but if we we'll get it off the table, we can uh, ask the applicant to whom, because okay. I assume it's the applicant that provided the plans to the neighbors. Okay, then I'll, so, I'll move to uh, remove this from the table. Is there a second? Consideration this evening. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of removing the matter from the table? Anybody opposed? I see none, uh, so it's off the table. And who's representing the applicant tonight? Yes, Mr. Traster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I begin, perhaps we could clarify uh, Mr. Frustacci's last question. I, I saw that you wanted to. I'm one of the neighbors. Oh. OK. Excuse me. I, I don't want you uh, in here. But he seems to be looking at me. Yes, he is. I'm not sure why. <laughs> I was going to invite her to address the, the. We'll provide an opportunity for people to speak later. Okay. But I was hoping that you or, the, or your client would be able to answer his question. It's my understanding that the, the uh, version of the plans that is uh, before the board now was were provided to the neighbors, and that is the plan to which the neighbors letters relate. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Michael Traster. I am an attorney in Portland with the firm Murray Plum and Murray, and I did represent the pages at the uh, last uh, hearing in July. As uh, I think everybody knows, this is now the third time we've been before this board. Uh, we were originally before the board in June, and at that time, uh, the Lakemans, Daniel and Faye Lakeman, appeared uh, with counsel and objected to uh, the proposal uh, of the pages for a, uh, a variance uh, to renovate uh, the existing structure at 172 Two Lights Road. Uh, since that time, well, I should, should just to back up, in June, there were a variety of uh, issues raised and discussed. Uh, this board uh, had some concerns regarding the proposal on the table and invited the pages to redesign their proposal to meet those concerns as well as to address the Lakeman's concerns. Uh, and we did that. Following the June hearing, uh, we met with the Lakeman's as I informed the board uh, at the July 24th hearing. And at our invitation, uh, we sat down, or the Lakeman sat down with their attorney, with John Bannon of my office, to discuss what the Pages plans were and whether there was anything that could be done to accommodate the Lakemans and address their concerns. I should point out that the Pages uh, not only invited the Lakemans to attend that meeting, but actually paid for the Lakemans' attorney to attend that hearing. And at that hearing, uh, I'm sorry, at that meeting, uh, the Lakemans uh, were asked what, what could be done to, to address their concerns. And those concerns at the time were concerns relating to water views. Uh, at the July, uh, June hearing, Mr. Danielson, attorney Bob Danielson, who was representing the Lakemans at the time, uh, made quite an issue of the Lakemans' water views. And the purported basis for the objection back in June was that the proposal uh, of the uh, renovation or addition to the Pages property at 172 Two Lights Road would impede and adversely impact those views, uh, and more specifically would adversely impact the property values, uh, uh, the Lakeman's property value. Uh, however, when we sat down in June, uh, the objection uh, was not based on an adverse impact on the property values. What the objection was, was a concern over privacy and whether uh, the Page's proposal might result in a family moving into the neighborhood, uh, in, which may in turn uh, somehow uh, impact the Lakeman's privacy. Uh, that meeting uh, ended. The Lakeman's provided us with no suggestions, no proposal, and simply uh, left it that they did not want uh, a renovation or an addition of any kind uh, to the 2172 Two Lights Road. Uh, we therefore uh, redesigned the uh, renovation anyway, and we redesigned it specifically to address the Lakeman's concerns over the alleged water views. Um, and what we, what we did was we brought the structure back off of Beacon Lane significantly. We also lowered the addition uh, on the northeast side of the property uh, where the alleged water views are claimed to exist, and I should point out, we, we dispute that there are any water views. And in fact, Mr. Lorry, at the last hearing in July, uh, pointed out to this board, and it plainly admitted that there would not be an, uh, an adverse impact uh, to the Lakemans with respect to their property value. Essentially, the target shifted. What we were hearing was it somehow impacted uh, the marketability of the property. But regardless, we, we dispute that there are water views. The, 
uh, Page's property is on the highest point of land there. And their views in the wintertime are extremely minimal from that highest point. We have provided uh, the board with pictures taken in the wintertime, and uh, I think that those are very telling. Um, but getting back to the redesign, what we've done is we lowered the addition four feet below the existing height of the home. The existing height of the home is 21 feet. The proposed addition would be 17 feet. We also reduced the bulk of that addition uh, in the area where the alleged views are, are claimed to exist and reduced the footprint uh, of that side of the addition. The addition on the other side, on the uh, southwest side, would be even with the existing house, that being 21 <coughs> feet. Since the uh, July hearing, uh, the board, of course, has, has gotten an, another uh, set of plans. And this is, of course, the plans, uh, the proposal we're talking about this evening. Essentially, uh, not, not much has changed. All that's really changed is that the garage and the uh, living space addition have been flip-flopped, where now the uh, garage will be on the northwest side and the addition will be, as I understand it, on the southwest side. Is that correct, Mr. Davis? I should point out that Mr. Uh, Zach Davis, the Pages Builder, is here with me this evening to answer any specific questions regarding the, uh, the redesign of the home. Uh, at the last hearing in July, uh, several questions uh, arose regarding both whether the Pages, in fact, needed a, a new, uh, completely new application and also uh, regarding uh, the legal standards which this court, uh, excuse me, this board must consider and which, which control this matter. I had submitted a memo to the board in July uh, setting forth uh, the Page's position and outlining the Lockport's more recent cases uh, which we believe control this matter. Uh, the board in turn had some questions about that. The Lakeman's attorney, Mr. Lorry, uh, took issue with some of the things there and the matter was referred to Mr. Hill, Mike Hill, the uh, board's attorney. And as we sit here today, Mr. Hill has now uh, confirmed uh, that a new applica uh, application is not necessary. Uh, and in addition, I think has essentially confirmed uh, what I was telling the board in July, namely that prior knowledge of zoning ordinances and the need for a variance does not equate to uh, self-imposed hardship. Mr. Hill has also opined that this board does in fact have the discretion and the authority to grant the Pages application. And we think, uh, of course, that we meet all the standards uh, required uh, for this board to do so. Uh, namely, those, those standards are, of course, the same as set forth in the state statute, uh, that the property not be able to um, um, uh, give the pages a reasonable return, and that, uh, I would point out, the Maine Supreme Court has stated it focuses on economic return. Uh, the property is unique with respect to uh, the other lots in the area, in the neighborhood. The uh, uh, granting of the variance will not change the essential nature of the, of the locale. It will not change the uh, nature of the neighborhood at all, because all we'll be doing, of course, is constructing a single residential family home, uh, which uh, within an existing residential family neighborhood. And finally, uh, the hardship uh, which the pages suffer is not self-created, particularly because, uh, as, as I've just said, the Maine Supreme Court has said that uh, knowledge uh, that you're going to need a variance does not equate to self-imposed hardship. I would uh, just back up and say that the testimony and the evidence in the record is, in fact, that the pages had no such knowledge. Ms. Mrs. Page testified that she did not uh, know that she needed a variance at the time she purchased the property, but regardless, that would not equate to undue hardship. And so, as I said, the uh, we've been over this this proposal several times. Uh, we believe we meet all of the standards uh, which need to be met, all four criteria. The need for the variance, of course, is created by the fact that there are two 30-foot setbacks applicable to the Pages property at 172 uh, Two Lights Road. The property, as, as of course the board knows at this point, sits between Beacon Lane and Two Lights Road. It is only 60 feet, 67 feet wide at its widest point. With two 30-foot setbacks, that would mean that the Pages would have a maximum seven-foot building envelope. 
and nothing can be done to bring this property into a reasonably habitable condition consistent with the surrounding neighborhood without a variance. That is clear. The, the neighborhood is, a, is single family residential use. The property now is uninhabitable and we've submitted a letter from the Pages broker dated August 11th, 99, which the chairman referred to, uh, which, which, which references the fact that the property is uninhabitable, that Mrs. Page uh, spoke with several contractors and had them look at, at the, the options she had, and those contractors told her that, it essentially told her it made no sense to renovate a 900 square foot dilapidated structure economically. What makes sense is to bring the property up to a reasonably inhabitable level uh, with vis-a-vis -vis square footage. An average home is 1,600 square feet. This home is 900 square feet. Beyond that, it's very important. This home is unusable. Essentially what you have is a blight on the neighborhood, something that's just sitting there. It's essentially it's a, a shack, for lack, lack of a better word. It cannot be used. And so what this board has to consider and I think the appropriate inquiry for this court is whether the pages will receive a reasonable economic return if they are required to renovate a 900 square foot home rather than renovate and, and, and expand the existing uh, property to a reasonably inhabitable level. And I think common sense would dictate, as the contractors told Mrs. Page, the former option really is no option at all. And so we think that we clearly meet the reason, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the standard that requires that the property not bear a reasonable return absent a variance. Mr. Hill has provided the board with copies of several of the relevant cases from the Maine Supreme Court, namely the Driscoll case. And, and I, I hope everybody's read that because I think it, it's essentially directly on point. In that case, you had a property owner that had a lot that Due to the setback requirements, uh, could, the owners could not construct a home absent a variance. Uh, the, the issues were the same. The, the property owners wanted to construct a home of reasonable size. They also wanted to uh, construct a septic system of reasonable capacity to service that home. And the local board ruled in favor of the property owners. They ruled that a 17 foot by 20 foot structure uh, would not give those property owners a reasonable return. And we think that that is exactly the same situation that we have here. We have a 900 square foot home. That is excessively small. That cannot be used by a, reasonable, a family of reasonable size, such as the Pages, who, who are a married couple with two, two children. And again, we think that case is very instructive. It's instructive not only because of what the Maine Supreme Court held, but it's instructive as to what the Supreme Court said in that case. And what, they, what the court said was, in reviewing the board's decision, it said that they are not going, that the court is not going to, to interfere with the judgment of the board. The, the, and I've, I quoted the relevant section in my letter to Mr. Hill, and perhaps, perhaps I could read it now. If you all have your copies of the case. I am reading from page seven at the bottom in the left-hand col column. The board, quote, the board composed as it is of local people possessed of experience and expertise in the field of zoning and knowledgeable, knowledgeable respecting the particular locality involved. In a case in which the evidence focused directly upon the undue hardship to the owners if little or enforcement of zoning restrictions were required, did not hear, need to hear testimony from an economist in the peculiar circumstances of the plot of land in question, we certainly have peculiar circumstances in this case, <coughs> to conclude that the building of a house within the limits of an area of 17 by 20 would not be economically feasible in terms of yielding a reasonable return on the property. And so we think it's clear that this board has the authority to exercise its knowledge of this community and grant the variance. And I believe that's what the town attorney has opined as well. Um, focusing again on, this, uh, on this, this standard, the reasonable return standard, because I think that that's, that's the most important issue we have to deal with this evening. Uh, the Lakemans have essentially said, 
yeah, well, there's a 900 square foot home there. They should be required, the pages should be required to use that. And what I want the board to understand is that there's not a 900 square foot home there. There is an uninhabitable, dilapidated dwelling there. In all of the law court's cases, and when I say law court, I'm referring to the main Supreme Court, which involved undersized homes in which that, the court concluded that the homeowner would be required to, to live with the current state of affairs, they, that landowner had a dwelling that they could use. It was inhabitable. That is not the case here. I think, uh, from what I understand, everyone on the board's been out to the property. You've seen it as well as, well as I've seen it, and, and you know what it looks like, and you know what, kind of, what, what condition it's in. And it would not be reason, uh, reasonable to require the pages or any other landowner who might take ownership of that property to spend the funds to renovate the existing structure and bring it to a, to, uh, uh, to a state where they have to, where it is inhabitable, but inhabitable at 900 square feet. That's what the contractors told Mrs. Page was made no sense, and, and I think that that's just common sense. And so we think we meet all of the standards uh, which, which we must meet. We've been here several times before. I think the board is obviously quite familiar with this, with this piece of property. And we would respectively ask that the board grant the application as it has the authority to do. Thank you, Mr. Traster. Um, Mr. Hill, of course, can speak for himself. But I'm a little concerned that uh, your, some of your statements are, are not the same interpretation of what Mr. Hill said in his August 18th letter as, as I read it. Uh, you have quoted several cases, Marchi originally and now Driscoll, both of which are undeveloped lots, as I recall. Certainly Marchi is. And, uh, uh, and I'm not aware of any cases that you have offered us that are similar situations where there's an established grandfather situation, whether it's a habitable house or an unhabitable house. There are grandfather rights that go with that. And I'm uh, Mr. Hill's letter was quite clear that the Marchi case is, does not apply because it uh, applies to an undeveloped lot, which was undersized, as you pointed out. Uh, and in another instance, you referred to the, the, the board being able to act on a reasonable return standard uh, with Mr. Hill's blessing, and yet the paragraph that I assume you're reading from refers to uh, determining whether strict compliance with the ordinance would result in the practical loss of substantial beneficial use of the land, uh, which is a somewhat different standard than you're suggesting we should uh, take, and more importantly than you suggested, Mr. Hill suggested we take, and so I want to get these inconsistencies squared, up, squared away. Mm -hmm. uh, can I respond to that? Please. Uh, the, you can, obviously, the board can read Mr. Hill's opinion, and Mr. Hill's here this evening and speak for himself. I, I, I believe that, that the opinion stated that the Marshy case was not, quote, directly on point. However, I think it certainly is on point. Uh, the, the, there is the distinction that the lot in Marshy was not uh, built upon, and there were no grandfathered rights. But I guess what I'm suggesting to the board is that the Page property essentially is vacant. It has to be considered vacant because the structure there is not usable. And even though the law court, certainly I would agree with you, has, has uh, defined the reasonable return standard, and, and that's the standard I've been using, that's the, uh, the words I've been using, that's, those are the words of the ordinance, the words of the main statute, um, they, have, they certainly have, and I would, I would not take issue with you at all, uh, describe that as practical uh, loss of all beneficial use of land. However, that phraseology, I think, has to be considered in the context, as the Maine Supreme Court has said, of reasonable economic return. And that's why I, I, I argued, as I did, that uh, I think the appropriate inquiry for the board is whether it's reasonable as an economic matter to require the pages uh, to rehabilitate a 900 square foot structure versus uh, spending uh, that money uh, to bring the, the home uh, into a state that's consistent with the surrounding neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Christian. Uh, do other board members have questions? Mr. Keneally. Um, 
Yes, it was my understanding after reading all the case law precedents that were referred to earlier that they all referred to undeveloped lots of land that were encumbered by zoning laws that came into existence after the lots were designed. You made a statement in your opening statement here about case law referring to undersized structures. Did you refer to a specific case? You used the word structures. Was that a misspoke, misspoken statement by you? Or? No, I, I, if I'm understanding the question, I, I agree with you that the Marshy case, the Driscoll case, were undeveloped lots. Right. There are cases involving undersized structures. That's what I'm saying. Did All of those cases. Case? Yeah. Uh, the, there are recent cases. Uh, there's the Roe case uh, v. City of South Portland, the Goldstein v. City of South Portland as well. These are, are recent cases from the, uh, this year. Uh, I'll tell you that in those cases, the Maine Supreme Court held that the variance uh, should not issue. And, but the point I'm making is in those cases, when analyzing the situation, uh, all of those cases involved uh, situations where the structure, although undersized, and uh, what was usable. That is not the case here. We don't have a usable structure. Okay, thank you. I'd like to, Mr. Chairman, if I may follow up on that a uh, couple ways. First is, wh where do you get this stat about uh, the average home being 1,600 square feet? That's my general common knowledge. Okay, is, is that for this particular area? for two lights for the town of Cape Elizabeth, state of Maine? I believe it's national. I can't quote you authority on that. Okay. So is your only point, your only support for being unusable, the fact that it's small? Uh, no, I have, uh, there, there are two reasons. And, and really, I guess I'm making a two-pronged argument. One is a 900-square-foot home, no matter what condition it is, is by current standards too small. The other point I'm making is, under the, the specifics of this case, not only is it too small, but it's not even inhabitable. It's not usable. It's not in an inhabitable state. And I think that's important because it's essentially as though there's nothing there. Why is it not inhabitable, though? I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. I mean, it, to say it's not usable because it's not habitable is just circular. I, what is it that prevents, it, prevents people, particularly the pages, from living in there? Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, as I understand it, uh, there was an elderly woman living there prior to the time the pages bought the property. By all accounts, it fell into an utter state of disrepair. Some of these issues, uh, I think, are referenced by uh, the letter from the pages broker, which I've submitted. Um, it, it's, it's, there are broken windows, uh, there's paper hanging off the walls, et cetera, et cetera. It's just not in a habitable state, and that's why the pages had their contractors go in and, and essentially ask them, what are our options? And what they were told was, it makes no sense for you to renovate the existing structure because you're going to wind up with 900 square feet, and, and that's, that's unreasonable. Small. That's too small. Are you done? Let me just follow up on that point additionally. Uh, I'm sure you must have gotten copies of Mr. Laurie's yes. two letters that were sent, and in both those letters, uh, he draws uh, repeated attention to the answer to a question raised by a board member in the first meeting when Ms. Page was here, uh, unrepresented, I believe, at that time. Uh, and that question basically was, what will you do if the board denies the variance? And the answer was, we'll, in effect, make do and we'll renovate what we've got and move in. So I think that's why I at least am having a little bit of trouble getting over this term, uninhabitable when in fact she does have uh, rights in the ordinance to build on the foundation that's there with a reasonable facsimile of the same size house, which she testified was something that clearly she wouldn't smile about, but that they would, that they would do. How do we get from those, or the difference between those two uh, positions? Yeah, I, I suspected that the board may ask me that question this evening, and I talked to Mrs. Page about that yesterday. And mm -hmm. what I can tell you as I stand here today is Mrs. Page's response to me was that she and her family do not intend on living in the house, living at the property. Uh, I asked her if she would renovate it, and the response I got was that that decision had not been made. I think when she was here in June, she was frankly caught off guard, uh, 
caught by surprise. As you said, she was not here with counsel. She did not even know that the Lakemans would be appearing objecting to the application. Um, but that is, is where the pages are today. They will have to decide if, if their application is denied, what to do with the property. But I asked her very clearly, so I understood her, will you live in the property? And the answer I got, Mr. Chairman, was no, we will not. Thank you. Question? Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, your argument uh, is about reasonable return seems to vary with the size of the house. At one point, was it, is it 967 square feet, not 900? Is that? 927, I believe. Or was 967. Just over 900. Okay. Um, now, I'm not an attorney. Uh, the town has provided me with a handbook for local appeals boards, a legislative perspective. And in this, it cites a case, and I wonder if you could comment on it. It's Anderson versus Swanson. Mm -hmm. 54A, 2D, whatever that means, 1286, May 1987. I'm Defendant purchased a small lot in a small 20 by 32 two-story house eight years after the city adopted zoning. Defendant sought a setback variance in order to build a large 24 by 36 addition onto the house. The Board of uh, uh, Appeals granted the variance and plaintiff appealed. Superior Court overturned the variance and the main Supreme Court upheld the Superior Court finding that the defendant had not shown undue hardship. The court found although the existing house was small, it offered adequate living space, and that the defendant had not shown that lo a loss of all beneficial use of the property would result without the variance. Yes, I'm familiar with that case. Uh, again, I think that the key difference between our case and that case is the applicants in that case had a house they can use. They were not required to expend significant funds just to bring the house up to a habitable condition because, again, the standard is reasonable return. It's an economic focus. And that's why I've, I've been saying this evening that I think the appropriate inquiry for this board is whether it's reasonable, whether a reasonable economic return would be had by the pages if required to renovate the existing structure, which I might add would have been probably t torn down if not for the pages' interest in historic preservation. But would they re receive a reasonable return when weighing renovating the existing structure versus bringing it into a condition that they can reasonably use? And so the Anderson case, and again, the, the cases I mentioned out of, out of uh, this, this term, uh, the Maine Supreme Court's current term, the Roe case and the Goldstein case, these were all situations in which the court analyzed the situation and basically said to the applicant, you have something you can use, you have to use it. We don't have something we can use. We have nothing. But Bruce, is, could this structure be bought up to date and renovated without a uh, variance? You, they wouldn't need a variance to, to reconstruct its present footprint, right? That's correct. Okay. Questions from other board members for Mr. Traster? Mr. Fustaci? Uh, yeah, I'd like to give Mr. Traster a break and ask Mr. Davis to come up. Would you introduce yourself, please, on the record? Yeah, my name is Zach Davis. I'm uh, the builder for Mary Page. Thank you. <clears throat> the reason I asked earlier about the, um, which plan was showed to the abutters or, or the community, <clears throat> simply uh, because it's changed from the first time to the second time. Could you kind of describe, if this was passed, what type of change would happen to the site right now? What would you have to do to accommodate the plan and the septic system? The, I am not a septic designer. and oh, It's I, already been designed and it's been located. Dick Sweet was responsible for that and handled that through uh, with Mary Page. And that has been kept out of my control at this point. I've been just asked to design the house itself. Okay, well, do you know where the location of that would be? I was told that it was going to somehow interfere with the current garage and that the current garage would have to be removed and for the new system. All right, well, there's a lot of trees to the right looking from um, Two Lights Road mm -hmm. to, the, to the present garage. That garage would come down. Would you say that those trees would have to be removed to accommodate the septic system? I, I couldn't cite on that specifically at this time. I do know that um, both Ron and Mary are interested in keeping the site to look as uh, close as possible to what it is now. So removal of trees, I wanted to remove a tree that was literally five feet away from the corner of the foundation because I thought that it would uh, affect their uh, roof 
and whatnot in the future. And they, she said, no, I don't want to touch that tree. I want to leave as many trees here as I can. Um, I was out there as late as uh, 6 o'clock this evening, and I, and I looked at it once more with the, with the new plan. Mm -hmm. And um, my concern was the trees, the proximity of the trees to the foundation and to the addition, the front porch. Mm -hmm. The birch trees exactly. on the front uh, look like that they're going to have to go. There's That's several spruce trees that look like they're going to be gone. Uh, as I mentioned, to the to the right of the garage, the, yep. uh, that area where the septic system would go. Uh, Moving the garage, flip-flopping the garage like we have um, from the last meeting, it would um, allow that more trees on the left, as you're looking at the house from Two Lights Road, more trees on the left could stay. They would wind up being close to the home, but there would not be any need to remove in terms of a driveway um, because as you look at the house to the right, that space has already been cleared. Um, in fact, that's where uh, the alleged water views were discussed. The driveway would then be looking from from um, Two Lights Road would be on the left-hand side of the house? No, it would be on the right. Okay. Okay, I see that now. All right, and that would have a full foundation underneath it? Uh, I don't think that it will. Uh, we haven't brought an excavator in and actually scratched the surface to, to clarify this, but from the appearance of the existing house and um, just from the existing site, there is a tremendous amount of ledge. Uh, so long as that ledge is solid, um, our hope is to have our um, uh, excavation foundation crew um, drill and tap and connect to the existing ledge. And so we wouldn't be blasting or, or placing a full four foot frost wall style foundation. Both of these would be uh, slab slab style with frost wall to four feet or ledge, whichever we hit first. What would the drop be from the house to the top of the finished garage floor? The drop be from the house? I'm not, I'm not understanding your question. Which part of the house? Yep. From the garage, from, well, the, the part of the house that's attached to the garage. This is going to be an attached garage. The and building is attached, but I don't believe that it is shown that you can actually walk from inside the house to inside the garage. But I think what your question is, the current floor of the house is about this high, three feet approximately off the ground. Um, and the current floor would be held as close to... Let's take a shortcut. Sure. Looking from Two Lights Road, what are you going to see on the back of the garage? Are you going to see three feet of, of concrete? All concrete is uh, exposed with lattice. So whatever concrete there would be there, you would have a lattice trim detail okay. from a water table um, down to the ground. It looked kind of high, and that's why I have a concern. Mm -hmm. um, I do okay. believe you will see exposed foundation, but you wouldn't see any more of the exposed foundation than what is already being exposed by the house itself. It would be that height consistent across. Okay, and same thing on the deck. I mean, that's up quite high Correct. now when you're going to show you're not planning to haul in any fill or anything like that around the house? Mary and I haven't discussed that. If, um, if it was the board's and neighbor's decisions to say, you know, we'd really be happy with this, but we wouldn't like to see from the foundation, I would feel as though um, those things could be met. Um, on the, again, looking from the uh, Two Lights Road to the left of the house. Yes. I see an atrium door. Yes. Um, are we planning to put a deck there? No. What is the atrium door going to open out to? It's going to open up to the outside. It was just to allow more light through um, that side of the building and to, if you're sitting in that room and you'd like to have more air, you can open up both doors and have plenty of fresh air come in and through. It was just an aesthetic choice. That are you going to have steps coming down from the... There may be a step, a wooden step attached to the house, but it appears to me that the, the ledge there is within a foot of the existing house, and right now at that site you only have a concrete uh, poured 
three foot by four foot lock in front of the doorway, and my, uh, my impression was that they would be the same. Let me tell you where I'm going, and if you haven't guessed, one of the comments made by Mr. Traska was that um, this plan would not essentially change the character of the neighborhood. Correct. Um, coming around the corner, the trees kind of block this house, and I think that it's a, it's a tremendous value mm -hmm. to it. And in looking at the proposal and the additional or the, the additions in the porch, I can't help but think that most of those trees are going to be gone and that it definitely would change the essential character of the neighborhood. But that's just my feelings, um, and uh, that's why I was hoping that this was the plan that was showed to other people so that they possibly All the neighbors consider received that. copies of all sets of plans, one, two, and three, all designs. That's all, all the questions I have, Jim. Any other questions for uh, Mr. Davis? Thank you, sir. Thanks. Um, Can I ask quite another question, Mr. Traster? Sure. Yeah, please. Mr. Traster, please. Yeah. Uh, was there any discussion of offering the Lakers a view easement in these discussions? Uh, not to my knowledge. I did not participate in the conversation directly. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Traster. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak on behalf of this application? Hi. Hi, I'm on Susan Dorr, and I live at 15 Beacon Lane, and I know that a petition came in that was signed by us, so it disturbed me that you didn't list it as one of the petitions, because we certainly are in support of the pages. And let me just give you a little background on this for why. Um, we were before this board about a year ago, and we got a variance from this board, 15 Beacon Lane, just down the street. And I was fortunate in that the neighbor most affected Right below me, Dale Weeks and his wife Janine, they were wonderful and supportive and they were terrific. They had been told by people that they didn't have the right to build a garage on the lot next to me. That wasn't the truth. They did have the right to build a garage. I realize this is a different situation, but I wanted to, let me just speak about their trees. When they said, gee, we're going to build a garage, how do you feel? I said, terrific. You take down some trees, I'll get some more sunlight, fewer mosquitoes. What I'm trying to say here is this. When I did my renovations, which are completed now, and thank you again for the variance, some neighbors were nice. Some neighbors were really frosty. Some neighbors threatened to sue my builders. That was too bad and unfortunate because I just took out a 30-year mortgage and they have to live with me for the next 30 years. I grew up in a neighborhood where when somebody new moved in, you bought brownies, came over, had a cup of tea, said welcome. I met the pages for all of five minutes. In fact, I haven't met him. I've only met her. She was out mowing the hay field there between nursing one kid and dealing with another kid. Of course, if you don't give her her variance, this is what she has the right to do. She has the right to fix up exactly what it is, paint it purple, rent it to a family of eight. That she has the right to do, whether there's one bedroom or six. And given the greeting that they've had, she might choose to do that. And I can tell you as somebody who had to look for rentals during my renovations, it would rent out awfully quick for an awfully high price, even at 900 and something square feet. So I'm not going to back up her attorney and tell you that nobody will rent it. But I am going to tell you that worse things can happen than that somebody puts in a nice addition and becomes your neighbor and just simply wants you to come over with brownies and have a cup of tea and say welcome to the neighborhood. And I don't fear somebody with a couple of kids. I kind of like kids. Um, we had good experiences and bad experiences in this. And, I, you know, if you have good experiences, there'll be more people invited to the house for me. If you have bad experiences, there'll be more food for those who are left. I'm encouraging you to have a little courage and do this because that place is a dump. And they have the right to fix it up to be a habitable dump and then rent it out. In fact, they could sell it to me, and I could fix it up to be a habitable dump and rent it out, and I might then paint it purple. Why would I paint it purple? Because some neighbor actually wanted to know what color I was going to paint my house as though they had some rights there. I find this all very odd because, you know, I was a Democrat coming to a town I was told it was Republican, and I thought Republicans care about property rights, and here I sit listening to people talk about can you take down this or that tree on your own property, and I'm kind of just stunned by this. 
I think it would be good for us to be neighborly. We really are a neighborhood. And when I look around, and I walk my neighborhood all the time now, and it's a delightful place, and I hope the pages come. It'll be a great place to raise kids. You can walk to the beach. Well, one of the things that's really true about my neighborhood is almost everybody has an addition on their house. I think my neighbors like my addition now that it's done. I feel badly that some of them misbehave. I want to state clearly for the record, the people objecting to this were not the people who gave me a hard time. But it was too bad for them in the end, the people who gave me a hard time. Because you can do worse than some new neighbors who want to fix something up and make it nice. So I got to tell you, I'm looking at foundation there now that raccoons can walk in and out of the foundation, wild animals are in and out of the house. For the longest time when we were there, we looked at mattresses against the windows. There's something that's a lot worse than having nice new neighbors with a couple of kids to raise. So I'm here to support it. And I've talked to a number of other neighbors. And if you've lost some of these petitions, I'll go around with one myself and get you some more. Because mine was certainly submitted the other day. And some of the neighbors I know, some of whom have had a hard time when they move in with their neighbors, in the end, we're all going to be here together. And I sure hope eventually it becomes a warm and fuzzy place. Thank you for your time. And Thank my you. entire family feels the way I do. Thank you. That's three voters. <laughs> Thank you. One of the frustrations the zoning board has is that it's not brownies and purple houses. It's uh, statutory language set by the council and the state government. So uh, I wish it were that easy. Uh, is there anyone else who wishes to speak in favor of this application? If not, is there anyone who wishes to speak in opposition? Yes, sir. Good evening. Go ahead. I'm Dan Lakeman. My wife, Faye, and I live at 22 Beacon Lane. Uh, our house is right across from the house that Mary Page owns. As you know, our attorney, David Laurie, can't be here tonight, and uh, he has already addressed the legal points of our position. I'd like to take this opportunity to present the personal side. Nine years ago, when we were considering buying our home at 22 Beacon Lane, our biggest concern was the house at 172 Two Lights Road now owned by Mary Page. That house sits right on Beacon Lane, close to the property that we were thinking of buying. And we very much enjoy spending time in our yard, gardening and so forth. So we wanted a quiet neighborhood, and we were attracted to the privacy that that property afforded. As you can see from the survey, and I believe you all have a copy of that one corner of Mary Page's house is about three feet from the lane, and the other is about six. So the house kind of looms right in our front yard. We realized nine years ago that if the house were enlarged, it would not only form a more extended wall along Beacon Lane in front of our house, but would also accommodate a larger number of people creating a lot of activity, more activity, practically in our front yard. Since the neighbors on one side of 22 Beacon Lane already had three young children, and the property on the other side, a two and a half acre lot, would eventually be developed and possibly house a large family, we were naturally concerned about also having a large family on the small lot in front of us. Understand that our family is grown up and moved away from home, and we don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to secure a little peace and quiet. So we did what any prudent buyer would do. We read the zoning ordinances. The zoning ordinances seem to indicate that hardship would be the only reason for granting a variance to expand the buildings at 172 Two Lights Road. But to be sure that our understanding of the ordinances was correct, we talked with both Ernie McVeigh and Jerry Daigle. They confirmed that Mrs. Clark or a subsequent owner would have to demonstrate a hardship that was not of their own making. 
in order to enlarge or step outside the footprint of the existing structures on this non-conforming lot. And we also described to Ernie the changes that we were planning to make to the house at 22 Beacon Lane if we bought it to, to be sure that those contemplated changes would fall within the existing zoning ordinances. With the reasonable assurance that the Clark property could not be expanded and that our own planned renovations met zoning requirements, we made an offer on the property that's been our home for the past nine years. Now, that offer was not accepted. So we had to think about whether increasing our offer made sense. A few days later, while talking with Mrs. Clark, the then owner of 172 Two Lights Road, she pointed out her view of the water. So it seemed likely that by removing some trees at 22 Beacon Lane, we would also have a view. So we got a contractor's estimate for tree removal, and we made a second offer, which was $20,000 more than our first. We were pleased that that offer was accepted, and we were able to buy the property, satisfied that having done our homework, we could improve our property to our specifications, maintain the relative privacy of the property, gain a seasonal water view, and rest assured that the town ordinances would protect us from an expansion of the house in front of us. And we're here tonight to ask you folks to stand by those ordinances that we relied on. Ordinances that we believe were created for the mutual protection and benefit of all property owners, whether an average American family, a large family, a single homeowner, a couple, or any other variation of home ownership. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lakeman. Uh, the board members have questions for Mr. Lakeman. Uh, in, when you first appeared before us, the thrust of your objection seemed to have been the impact of the proposed uh, second story addition on your water view. Uh, has the Proposal now put that issue to bed? That is no longer the issue, is that right? We actually have never changed our position. I, we hired attorneys, as you are well aware, and our attorneys presented the case however they felt they needed to present it, and you have their information. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we did pay additional money, made, made a larger offer on the property once we discovered the water view. Is that no longer an issue if the water with, with this proposal? Uh, if, this, if a garage were approved on the northwest side of the building, which was only one story, uh, as I recall, your, the thrust of your objection was the addition on, over the garage, the living space over the garage, was, would interfere with your water view. We uh, would yes? be, yes, excuse me. So is that issue been put to bed? Uh, we would be concerned that the height, uh, raising the height of any of the buildings on the property would infringe on the view. But concern. the present proposal before us calls for a garage with a height of uh, does it, we have a dimension on the height of the garage for 17, 17 feet as opposed to the uh, 32 feet I believe we're looking at before. The 32? No. And I'm trying to understand, the board was sympathetic to, to, to uh, your objections regarding the loss of your view. Yes. And so now it looks like you're not going to lose a view if the garage were there. Now, uh, <clears throat> is there any other specific objection uh, outside of, you did mention that the, a larger house would accommodate a larger family. I'm not sure there's I won't comment on that. Uh, I guess, uh, the impact of this property as it, at a, uh, on, the pro on your property value probably lowers your property value now. Uh, at least I would think so. I'd be less likely to buy your property looking at it myself. Uh, yeah, it's just, yes. And 
The thrust of your objection is that the not any not any concern right now. Am I, am I stating the position correctly? But that uh, the property uh, does not meet the hardship variance. Is that the sum and substance of, of your position? When we bought our property, we were expecting that house. As I said, we did this research. We expected that property to maintain that character with no expansion of the structures on that property. We were concerned that it would, it might change, and that was what we addressed before we made an offer on the property. But the property could be expanded within the seven foot, 30 foot setback on either side. Did, did you consider that? Uh, you said you realized that it couldn't be expanded, but it, in fact, it, it could be expanded if you wanted to have little seven foot wide rooms on either side. Uh, we did the best we could in researching the zoning ordinances yeah. and then speaking well, to- 67 feet wide, if you require 30 feet setbacks from each end, that leaves a seven foot envelope that they could build along across. And you, you said that you relied on the uh, zoning ordinance to realize this property couldn't be expanded, but in fact it could be expanded, but uh, maybe in, in an absurd way. So did you consider that possibility? That the impact on your views could be obstructed by a seven-foot wide addition? I'd have to say that we, we didn't. We researched the ordinances and then consulted with the uh, code enforcement officer and the assessor at that time. Okay. And they both felt like there would be, there could be no change to the property for all intents and purposes. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. LeBron. I'd like to follow up on that a little bit. With the proposed structure that we have now on the table, Will that or will that not obstruct your water views? Or do you not know? I truly don't know. It would be very difficult to, to That's determine. The answer, then. Thank yes. You. Yeah. Anyone else? I, Ms. Sullivan. Go ahead. I'm still confused about your water views. Could you describe what they were when you purchased the house nine years ago and what they are today? Uh, when we purchased the house nine years ago, there was growth in between us and 172 Two Lights Road. So there was no water views that time. After we spoke to Mrs. Clark before we made our second offer on the property, she showed us her water views and we determined by removing the trees in that corner of our property that we would gain that water view. And after those trees were removed in the wintertime, we had the same, same glimpse down through the trees, through the oak trees, they're primarily oaks, from the second story. Do you have those views today? No. No, there's trees, there's leaves on all the trees. Do you have, did you have them last winter? Yes. If not, thank you, Mr. Lincoln. Wait, wait, one, one more That's question. Right. Sure. Did you consider, or would you consider, uh, uh, withdrawing objections in exchange for a view easement, in which case the owners of the property would never, they could never allow trees to grow up or build a, a seven foot wide addition which would obstruct your view, uh, thereby guaranteeing you a view? Uh, is this something that that uh, suggestion you'd be amenable to, to withdraw your objections uh, in exchange for a view easement? I don't know exactly what that means. We have to consider that uh, they couldn't let trees grow up, which would obstruct your view. They couldn't build anything, which would obstruct your view uh, of the water. It would guarantee you the view, just as I don't, I'm not sure what, what, what your interest, if you have an interest or just a general objection that you, and I'm think, trying to think, is there a way to, to protect your interests here and, and guarantee you a view? And I, it, it might be something you, you, worth considering to, uh, to uh, if you're trying to work it out with the, uh, uh, name Blake. Uh, I, I have to say, Mr. Cronin, I'm, I'm, I was certainly unclear two months ago when uh, the, the attorney 
before Lakeman's brought that issue up, and I'm even less clear now that it's relevant to the criteria that the board has to work with under this particular application. It would help me if you could tell me where you're connecting it. I'd like to see things worked out. Uh, down on Smuggler's Cove, there, uh, there is a huge house, which I, well, I was called the Spite House, where the person wanted to build. The Spite House. Spite. <laughs> that house, the owner, I was on the board back in 92 when this was, uh, the owner wanted to build a, a, a modest addition. The neighbors came out, objected to everything he could possibly do. He was denied a variance. He had a courtyard out in front of the house, so instead he built a three-story house within the setbacks that he had there, which destroyed everybody's view. And I think this board has tried to work out accommodations uh, sympathetic to people's interests and views. Uh, and I think it would have been better for the town, better for the neighborhood, and better for all concerned if that variance had gone through and, it, and some sort of accommodation could have been achieved. I think the house that's down here and ugly it, it is, is oversized and ridiculous. Uh, I see a, a, a blight and an eyesore in the neighborhood now, uh, and I'm trying to suggest to the people involved that there are ways of guaranteeing their interests uh, and, uh, and, and is given yet to be attained. That's all. Just a suggestion. <clears throat> Any other questions for Mr. Lakeman? Thank you, sir. Yeah. Anyone else who wishes to speak in opposition to this application? If not, the hearing will be closed. And uh, before we go, yes, I'm sorry. You have to be a little quicker. <laughs> I'm Faye Lakeman. Uh, Why don't you pull I the just, microphone down so you don't have to. I just want to say, uh, and I know why Dan didn't bring this up, we didn't want to do any mudslinging, but we did meet with the um, Page's attorney. Um, nothing was offered. Uh, it was a very, um, he basically attacked us immediately. It was a very unpleasant, hostile meeting. And um, I don't like to see us being portrayed as uncooperative or unwilling to listen to some reasonable proposal. Uh, believe me, there was nothing forthcoming it was just attack, 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 and it was very unpleasant. I do feel that we made uh, an effort to meet the pages halfway. That was obviously not the intent of their attorney, John Bannon, in that meeting. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions for Mrs. Tracy? If not now, we'll close the hearing. And uh, before we go any further, I'd like to offer our town attorney, Mike Hill, a chance to uh, get grilled. <laughs> Aren't you lucky? Yes. Uh, can you start by going back to the series of questions that I was asking Mr. Traster about who gets to interpret your letter? <laughs> yes. Since, uh, or if you want to start somewhere else, I just want to make sure that's covered. No, uh, that's a good place to start. I. I'm not advocating uh, uh, for the pages application. That I, um, my, my, the thrust of my letter is that it's within the board's discretion. I, we, our office uh, tells you when you have to make a decision one way or the other, when you're bound by law to make it, or if, it's, uh, uh, if reasonable minds could differ where, it, where it's uh, in your discretion to make a decision. So uh, I, in this particular case, I think Mr. Traster has done a good job advocating his client's position. Um, but I just wanted to point out that the Marchie case and the Driscoll uh, case are distinguishable because we're dealing with vacant lots, not existing non-conforming structures, which have certain uh, grandfathered status and, and existing uh, rights to uh, use existing property, existing structure. Um, he makes a point that, you know, it's in such rough shape right now that it's essentially vacant uh, property. And, you know, I, I think it's an interesting argument. It's not one that's really been tested, but that's, that's his best argument. Um, and again, I think it's, it's within the board's discretion to make that determination. But I think that in making in order to find in favor of the pages, you'd have to find that the existing um, 
restricting the pages to the existing structure would result in the practical loss of all beneficial use of their property as a single family dwelling. Is it yeah. loss of all beneficial use or loss of substantial benefit? It's substantial, yes. Can you, uh, at risk of interrupting your thought yeah. pattern, uh, it's important to me to not lose um, the phrase, and I may be misquoting Mr. Traster here, but uh, reasonable economic return, which came up many times in his reference to both his view and, and uh, quoting from a court case. And uh, I didn't find that in any of the cases I read. It must be there somewhere, but I just didn't see it. But there's two separate phrases that sound like they're potentially conflicting there. Can you help me out? Well, uh, the, the standard itself talks about a uh, reasonable rate of return on the property. That, that the, in this case, the pages could not get a reasonable rate of return on the property uh, without the variance. And that has, uh, the, when you read that, the logical interpretation is values, uh, what's it worth, what, what would it be worth on resale, and those types of economic-based uh, issues. And that is certainly the case in a uh, claim for a taking. We talk a lot about the economic value and the investment back, uh, uh, reasonable investment back uh, uh, decisions that a, that a person would make on a property. But the law court has consistently talked about, in a variant situation, the substantial loss of, uh, or the loss of, practical loss of all uh, substantially beneficial use of of the property. So we're really, I think we've, the court focuses on the use rather than what is the, what's the value of the property. But I think it's certainly a reasonable argument that if it's um, uh, going to cost an exorbitant amount to improve the existing structure, if it is in fact uh, dilapidated, and I haven't seen it, but uh, that was a testimony today. Uh, that, that's a factor that the board can consider. How much money is it going to cost for that? And what are they going to be left with in terms of the use of that property once they've invested all that money? Are they going to be able to use it as a single family home? Uh, that, that's an issue. It, again, it's oh, different. A yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> when you say they, there's a difference between saying, are they going to be able to use it? And Mr. Traster made this point several times. As opposed to, can it be used? I, and I, I don't mean they, meaning the pages. <laughs> I mean, can it, is there beneficial use to the property <laughs> as a single family home? Yes. So uh, I, I do think that the board can consider this particular applicant and, its, and uh, their circumstances, but it's, it's, I don't think you're limited to that. It's not specifically th these people. Uh, if they, if they didn't have any children, maybe your decision would be different. If they had a larger family, would it be different? Uh, but it's a factor, but I don't think it's a determining factor, okay? You're not coming along and making this easy for me, are you? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I don't want to further uh, confuse things, but I'm a little confused as to what the, the setback is. and. Uh, since we have a non-conforming lot, we have a, uh, an existing structure on that, Bruce, is we're in the RA district. Are, are Beacon Lane and Two Lights Road considered local roads, so the setback is really 25, or is it 30? The reduced setback on a non-conforming lot can be, can be down to 25 feet. I've taken the stand to advertise from the required setback yeah. of the district, and that's why uh, it was advertised from 30. The end result, uh, as far as the distance from would be the same whether you advertise it for 30 or 25. Um, I have since, since this has come out, I reviewed the audience and, and found that it would be better to advertise the reduced setbacks as the required setbacks uh, so this confusion won't happen again. But yes, indeed, on a, on a non-conforming lot, setback can be as little as 25 on a, re, on a, on a reduced to on yeah. a non-conforming lot. So, I mean, we, we talked about the lot being 67 feet wide and two 30-foot setbacks gives you a seven-foot wide building envelope. If it's really 25, are we talking a 17-foot building envelope for, for an addition? 
without a variance? 60 to 65. Is it, uh, what's, the wide, what's the width of the lot? Is it 67? Six, at, the, at the widest, it's a 67? Mm. So, you know, 50 feet of it is eaten up by the reduced setback of 25 feet, so it would leave you with a 17-foot wide envelope. And I, I, again, I don't, I don't mean to throw another thing out there, but it seems to me you, you, the board has to decide whether they've lost the use of the property uh, unless the variance is granted. And it, it seems to me if you can add uh, you know, a 17-foot wide structure without a variance, or a 17-foot wide addition without a variance, that's something that the board needs to consider. And I, again, I don't know how wide that, you know, 17 feet wide, how, how long is it? I don't know. Uh, but I, that, I hope I, I follow that. What you're saying is that the, the constructive uh, result of the way the ordinance reads is that you can allow a 25 foot setback on both frontages in this situation? That's correct. Okay. And you're saying as a result, the seven foot envelope is actually 17 feet? I believe so. The applicant, the applicant was aware that the setbacks are 25 feet. The mm -hmm. only difference between what she was aware of and what was advertised was that I, the advertisement was always back to the required setbacks for a particular district. In order to get the, In order the worst to make case sure scenario. To cover the, venere, the variance mm -hmm. to its utmost. Uh, and that's the only difference. The end result is that the, the envelope has not decreased because it was advertised at 30. The envelope's always been there. Hmm. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, Some, anything else you wanted to say, Mike? No, I, I, think, uh, I think I've covered it. Distinguishing the the Marchi and the Driscoll cases. I mean, here we have a, a non-conforming structure, a grandfathered non-conforming structure that's, I believe, 30 by 30 feet. Um, so I, I think that in order to find that uh, the property can't uh, yield a reasonable rate of return, the board would have to find that the uh, existing structure in its, in its current condition uh, cannot yield a reasonable rate of return without the variance. In, in other words, can't be uh, practically used as a single family dwelling in it, uh, at this point. In its current condition? Well. Um, or in its current configuration? The current configuration, yeah, because they, they have grandfathered status. They have the rights to improve the existing structure, although it may be in a state of disrepair, they certainly have some vested rights that the applicants in Marchi and Driscoll did not have. They did not have the ability to put in uh, a 30 by 30 foot house in those two cases. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, so just say no comment if this is the appropriate uh, answer to my question, but I was, uh, in response to Mr. Cronin's question, I was still struggling with slotting, if you will, the issue which has come up many times of the view from the Lakeman's property uh, and it's, it's how it's affected by this proposal, uh, or at least as it was affected previously. Um, is that slottable in the criteria that are under us? I, I, I'm having a hard time with it. No, I don't, I don't think it is. Uh, the, State statute allows a town to adopt a, a different set of ordinance statute, uh, standards, rather, and one of those standards is that, uh, that the application or the proposed variance doesn't uh, adversely affect the adjacent property values. And so if, if we were operating under that uh, standard, I think it would be a relevant inquiry, but it's not really one of the four standards that we have. I, I mean, I think it's laudable to try to have people uh, uh, work together and resolve their differences, uh, but this board, as a quasi-judicial body, has to apply the standards uh, that are set forth in the ordinance, and, and, and adversely affecting an adjacent property owner's 
uh, water view or value isn't one of the standards under the current ordinance. Do other members have questions for Mike? Uh, I take it then that with a 17 foot wide envelope, the applicant could build without requesting any variance at all, 35 foot tall extension, as long as it stayed within that 17 foot envelope. Uh, yeah, if there is, if, if, if I'm right that it's 25 feet, then I think that gives them a 17 foot wide uh, building envelope, and I haven't done the math to figure out what square footage that they would add to. They could go to. 35 feet up. Is that right, Bruce? Uh, I think the applicant should look at the plan and come up with that measurement because mm -hmm. it's not my position to do so. Yeah. Uh, it's not. But it's I mean, I'm doing the math on here. I don't get 67 it's feet, not but. In here. Excuse me, sir. Well, you can't be heard because. Uh, <laughs> Can I the you please. This is Mr. Davis. Yes, it is Zach Davis again. Um, I'm not even going to do the math here myself because, on, you know, in front of this board, I'm not going to yeah. multiply numbers in from my head. <laughs> even if you have 67 feet at the widest point, it's a tapering lot, so your building envelope isn't going to be 17 feet wide all the way across. It's going to taper. But could a angular building be built within an envelope of whatever dimension, three feet, seven feet, 17 feet, up to 35 feet of the, from the average elevation current to the mean of the uh, roof pitch, which isn't the top of the roof, but in the middle of the actual rafter pitch, yes, in that rafter pitch could be, I didn't gather that there was a particular pitch described. So we could almost go straight up with the roof. And all we have to do is be halfway up the roof. So we could end up, this thing could go however tall you want and be whatever angular dimension to be within the envelope. Yes, that is possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Any other questions for Mr. Hill? You got off pretty easy, actually. Thanks. Um, guess what? It's ours to deal with now. Who wants to start the discussion? Could I ask where this uh, provision about the reducing the setback is? Just wanted to read the read the provision. <coughs> It's under nonconformance 1943, page 31. Page 31. Page 31. Page 31. Okay. While Bob is working on his numbers, anybody else okay. want to May go I, ahead, Mr. LeBron? Um, I actually think this is a pretty simple question, and the only issue is uh, in our discretion whether, without the variance, the pages will lose substantial beneficial use of the land. And we've heard all the facts, and we just have to make a decision whether that's the case or not. Um, one important point is it's not the Lakemans versus the pages. Uh, it's it's simply whether, in our discretion, the facts support. Uh, their request for a variance. I think that their attorney goes a little too far in saying that the property is unusable. Um, I really personally would not support any finding that says a house is unusable simply because it's too small. Um, I understand the zoning ordinance is intended to protect a certain quality of the property in this town, but I, I don't think it's meant to um, preclude small homes. 
But the, the issue isn't whether there will be no use of the land, as he's argued, but whether it will lose substantial beneficial use of the land. And uh, I, I think there's ample facts to support that it will. Um, it, it certainly sounds like it's not the type of place that any single family would live in without increasing the size of it a little bit. And I, I, I don't think that's too difficult of an issue. Uh, other comments? Well, I, I think that even at 927 square feet, it would be adequate for a single person or for a couple. So I think the restoration of the existing structure uh, would certainly satisfy those requirements. I don't, I don't like to say that, but looking at it in a statutory sense, I think that's the way I interpret it. Anybody else want to jump in? Joe? Tom says it's a very simple question. Uh, it may be a simple question, but I don't think the answer is that simple. Uh, I think that um, for the specific family that's requesting the variance, it, may, it might be difficult to um, utilize or get, get the benefit from the house. But for someone else, it may not be a difficult choice. Uh, 900 square feet would be more than adequate for them. So uh, with that, I, you know, that's why I say it's a difficult, difficult answer. I, I've heard the typical family uh, in the argument presented by the attorney for the pages and um, what they want in the house, but I haven't seen any justification or anything that satisfies the, the need for a, a yard for the, the typical family. Uh, the size of the garage for a typical family, 16 by 20, uh, appears to be inadequate. So, I mean, I'm, I'm on the fence, um, and I haven't been satisfied on, on, on those two issues. Um, I hate to say this, not that because I'm on, on camera, but the John Bath once wrote uh, uh, an argument uh, whether, whether uh, paths should we be laid where people walk or should people walk where paths are laid. <laughs> and here's a, here's a clear cut issue as to, you know, what do we do? Um, changing times, make new paths. Um, and the, uh, the lake men's are saying uh, <laughs> the paths have been laid, walk on them. Um, I'll wait to hear hear more testimony from other, or more comments from other board members. Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, Mr. Again, Brown. Mm -hmm. try not to say too much here, but um, I, I completely agree that the, the size as, as it's been described and shown to us, I, I won't agree with any factual finding that, that that's too small, because I just think that's an inappropriate view. And for some people, that would be perfectly fine. Uh, I think we were told by our attorney that we, were, we can take into consideration the, the, this particular family. Uh, and I also think that we have taken into consideration in looking at the reasonableness and the substantialness of the beneficial use of the land, the neighborhood. Um, I haven't taken square foot measurements of all the houses in the neighborhood, but I, I think that uh, w what is proposed here is something that I view as bringing it into line with, with the rest of the homes in the neighborhood uh, and is very reasonable in, in that respect. So I, I think it's, we, we have a certain amount of discretion here, as we were told, and I think that we can exercise that to, uh, to allow for these very reasonable and uh, still somewhat modest improvements to, to a property that needs it. Mr. Chairman, just um, sure. well, I was doing some quick math while these people were, <laughs> were, uh, were fighting the, the, the math here. And based on the um, comments by um, Attorney Hill, if you had a 25-foot setback 
on Beacon Lane and a 25 foot setback on Two Lights Road, there should be a 10 foot envelope uh, at, the, at the minimum uh, for an addition. Meaning, as Mr. Davis said, meaning they don't have to be, be, I mean, based on what he said, they don't have to be before us uh, to uh, expand this house. That there is an area for them to add on to. I looked at that too. I, I think it would be kind of a silly looking house, though. It would be sort of a wedge here. You'd have to rebuild the existing structure, drop a 10 foot uh, addition on one side, and if it's 38 and 40 and, and 16 is uh, 54 and 9 is 63, uh, build a 14 foot wide structure in the other. If the person is denied, if the applicant, if Mr. and Mrs. Page, are denied and they proceed with what they can legally do, I think that it will be to the detriment of the neighborhood and the town. And maybe that, maybe that shouldn't be a consideration, but uh, if they built a 35 foot high, 15 foot wide uh, addition on their northwest side, uh, the Lakers are going to lose a lot more of their water view than they would have lost under the approval of the variance. So, I, again, I, 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 I'm sympathetic that we are, are we're a judicial body, but we're also a municipal body that has to take into account interests uh, and try and and look for a solution that will pass muster and is acceptable to to the people in the neighborhood and the abutters. So the alternative to me, what they can legally do is is, is, is much more objectionable than what they're asking for. You need to change tapes, Leslie? Um, yes. Why don't you go ahead and we'll take a break here. Five deep breaths, clear your head. Mm -hmm. Take five deep breaths and clear your head. Well, <laughs> okay. anybody else wants to address the issue? I, I um, you know, our, our hearts are pulling us in all kinds of directions here. I think, but I, I mean, I have to fall back on town council's advice to us, which is that the variance can only be granted if the board finds that restricting the pages to using the, the existing structure would result in the practical loss of substantial beneficial use of the property, and uh, that's a um, very difficult one for me to get beyond. One of the th things that I'm having some difficulty with, those of you who have been on the board with me for the last two and a half years know that uh, I have s many times struggled for practical solutions, but I have to tell you that, that I went to school on this particular application both because of the unusual nature of it and because of the uh, also unusual nature of the advice we've been getting from three different attorneys, uh, t actually four, it was another attorney in the first meeting, uh, and the court cases that were provided on the point and uh, caused me to go back and reevaluate my position. Uh, the other thing worth pointing out is, you know, uh, we have been uh, strongly recommending to the planning board and hopefully ultimately to the town council that the ordinance be modified in some manner to take account of the difficulties that variances sometimes create in these tiny lots in a town like the Cape where uh, there are a lot of existing homes and uh, the current standards really aren't helpful in many of these cases. This is certainly one of them. Uh, and if we ever finish this one up, I will get to that item on our agenda later in, in the meeting uh, as to what the planning board has been doing with that. But. Uh, I guess I, I'm coming to the conclusion, which I'm surprising myself that I'm here, is, uh, to, is that um, the state law, which the ordinance parrots word for word, really doesn't allow in this configuration, in this particular version, a whole lot of room for maneuvering. 
Uh, and I think it's that reason, for that reason, that the, that the legislature was pressured to offer an alternative for municipalities, uh, so-called practical difficulty law, and uh, that's available to be adopted for those communities that are feeling the pinch of the hardship standard, and I hope the board will do that, but I am in a position now where I feel necessary to vote uh, in accordance with my understanding of the current, my current understanding of the current ordinance, which is that uh, substantial beneficial use is inherent in this property, uh, even in its current condition, uh, because it has grandfather rights and uh, could be built on, albeit in a small house, but since I live in a small house, I guess that it's not something that I think eliminates its substantial beneficial use. So I will be depending on how the motion is worded, voting in a way that uh, is in opposition to this uh, proposal. Unless somebody has something else to say. Uh, yes. Please, Ann. I think it's my turn to weigh in. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I must say that I'm, I'm one of those people that gets torn by, by my heart as well as by um, restrictions from, from uh, statutes and regulations. And I, I have to weigh in, in in favor of the opinion just voiced. Um, I've been swaying throughout the arguments, um, feeling, feeling Tom's heart and yours. Um, but I, I keep coming back to looking at, at, at the Twig case and about the issue about reasonable use and that it's, it's clear that there can be made reasonable use of this property by any numbers of kinds of people and families, um, perhaps not this one. Um, and it's, it's um, particularly unfortunate that this, this home, um, this former home, um, is such an eyesore to the neighborhood and that we'd all like to see it improved for the benefit of the community. Um, but in this case, I'm torn by the, um, I'm swayed by, the, by the, the way the Twig case was ruled, it's that under under the confinements that we have, I'll, I'll have to turn it down as well. The outcome is still uncertain. Does somebody want to make a motion so we can deal with this uh, in front, with a motion in front of us? Mr. Chairman, I'll move that the application of Mary Page for a variance from the strict application of the zoning ordinance requirement of section 19-6-1 be denied on the basis that the land in question can yield a reasonable return without a variance. Is there a second to that motion? Second. No discussion of the motion. Can we go down through the finding of facts individually? Certainly. And vote separately on those, please? Did you have a particular comment or question on any one of them before we do that? I have no comment, just okay. a vote on each one of them. Okay. Well, Basically, do uh, you want to amend your motion, uh, Jack, to at least include the other three items and then we can deal with them? My understanding was it's a four-prong test. If any one prong is not met, then it, it fails. Is that That's correct, and, but one of the members has asked for us to uh, consider each of them, three. so let's okay. do that. The second test is that the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. The third condition would be that the granting of a variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. And the fourth is that the hardship is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. I, I guess my opinion, personal opinion, would be that based on what Mike Hill has told us, that this would be a self-created hardship. So your motion would uh, to uh, not approve the variant, variance would be based on uh, a negative answer basically for a reasonable return and a, a negative answer for uh, self-created hardship. Well, I, I purposely refrain from including number four because I okay. feel it's more of a gray area than number one is. You needn't include it in your motion if you don't want to. But uh, I purposely declined to include that in the motion. Okay. Well, the assumption is if it's not in your negative motion, the other three will be considered uh, uh, positive in a nature, if you want to call it that, that they aren't negative. I'm really working my way into a double negative here. Uh, so your motion is, is based on uh, the issue of substantial 
use and reasonable return as set forth in uh, item number one. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, just a clarification from the town attorney. Mike, do we need to, um, through the chair, do we need to vote on each one of these individually? Should we? I, I would recommend that, that you, you do uh, so that the record is clear as to why the, uh, why you voted the way you did. If the okay. application is denied, what the, why, why it's denied, what prong it, it failed to meet. I'm not trying to confuse the issue. I just yeah. want to make sure no, the record shows it's, it's that uh, we do consider the four of these uh, uh, conditions. It's perfectly appropriate. Uh, would you, are you requesting that each of them be in, voted on individually as suggested? Yes, I am. Okay. A point of Mr. order. Brunner, uh, go ahead. You made the statement that if we didn't vote it in the, in the negative on, we would assume that we approved it. Uh, I, I'm, I, where I'm coming from is that one of these court cases, uh, the basis for denying a, a variance was one factor in the court overruled, and it assumed that, in fact, that that was the only reason why the variance was denied, and this, uh, this was the grounds for overturning the denial of a variance. Uh, so this means we have to debate all of the criteria and vote on, vote on them individually? No, I'm not asking to debate them. I'm asking to vote on each, each uh, item. If, so if, that we're, if we're going to vote on it, then, then it's discussable. Uh, all I'm saying, uh, Mr. Cronin, to make life easier, I hope, is that uh, I interpret and have been con had it confirmed that Mr. Keneally's motion would be that the uh, application be denied on the grounds that it does not meet number one, and I take it from the absence of any comment that he believes it meets the other three, uh, and we can vote on each of those uh, in that vein at the request of Mr. Fatashi and the advice of our council. Any other discussion? Uh, I think that if we deny this variance that the town will be the poorer, the neighbors will be the poorer, the applicant will be the poorer, the neighborhood will be the poorer. Uh, maybe that shouldn't be a consideration for us as our attorney suggested. Uh, but if the applicant then bills within the available envelope based upon the 25-foot setback, it's going to be one long, ugly house, <laughs> and it's going to be another, another smuggler's cove house. I would, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I would also like to add, based on some of the comments that I've heard, um, anybody who knows me knows that I don't have a heart, so I'm not voting <laughs> on my heart. I, I'm an attorney, and I, I interpret statutes all the time. I, I know how to do it. It's my interpretation that we have the discretion under this statute to do the appropriate thing, which is to grant the variance. I would certainly agree. I've seen you'd be heartless, so there's no, <laughs> no arguing there. Uh, any other comments before we vote on this? Let's deal with them one at a time, then. The uh, motion, as I understand it, would be to uh, deny the proposal by the application by Mary Page for a variance from the strict application of the ordinance uh, for a front property line variance of 24 feet on Beacon Lane and from a front, uh, front property line variance of 12 feet on uh, Two Lights Road to construct additions to the existing family, single family dwelling. Uh, and. Uh, all those in favor of that motion, we're dealing now strictly with the reasonable return criteria. Do we have to have a second to the motion? Uh, we had a second to your motion initially, and oh, it didn't change as I understood it. So, okay. all those in favor of that motion as worded? It's three in favor. Those opposed? One, two, three opposed. Motion doesn't carry. Is there an alternative motion? Can we vote on the other three, please? I'm sorry? Can we vote on the other three? We can. Um, Would it be easier to make a proposal and then vote? Then yeah, vote? I, I guess I'd rather not. It, it's it's I'd, kind I'd of the, confusing. I'd move the motion. The motion is the four-pronged the four -pronged item, and I'd like to go right so now. Your, the, your motion is that the... Uh, no, it's not a motion. I'm supporting the motion on the floor. And the motion was to, to deny the variance 
based on the four items. I'm sorry, I thought you raised your hand in the opposition, are you? I did. One point of order then, there's no motion on There's the no motion on the floor then, that's... Yeah. I, I would like to make a motion that... Well, wait a minute, excuse me. Go ahead, sorry. And, and Mr. Hill, you can chime in at any time. We have a motion, a four-part motion. One of those items didn't carry. Another one might carry. And that's why we vote on the four items separately. Because if one doesn't carry, it doesn't mean that the, that the motion uh, uh, is denied or approved. Mr. Hill, is that correct? Um, now I'm totally confused. Since it requires all four items to right. uh, be uh, affirmed in some way or other, uh, the motion, the alter, un underlying intent of the motion, which was to... to uh, is is that motion then defeated? Approve is not going to be. I mean, we can go through them if you want. I have no objection to that, but I don't see where it gets us. We're going to have to come back to an alternative I'm asking, motion. I'm asking. The, the motion was to deny the variance application because it didn't meet the first criteria. Uh, as I understood the motion as it was revised, uh, the motion was that the, the, or the findings rather, were that it, it uh, doesn't meet the first standard, but it met the other three. Am I? That's correct. Yeah. So. Well, I question. I question uh, item. Item three. The essential character of the neighborhood will not be altered. Yeah. And you. I think it's helpful to take each individual item uh, separately and vote yes or no on each one. So it's clear if there is an appeal, we know what the issue is on appeal. Uh, and and it, given the, the existing. The motion that was voted on, the only reason that the variance application failed was that uh, it didn't meet the first prong. So I, I, I think we're... The motion is dead. The only problem is since the motion is moot, there was a tie vote. Okay. The motion doesn't yeah. carry. Right, it's gone. <laughs> it needed a four, you needed four in favor, uh, in favor of the variance application for it to... So the motion, is, the motion so, is denied. Right, so the variance would be denied on the three. So it's also important to carry on the other three items. Simple. Well, now, wait a minute. I hate to argue Robert's rules with you, of all people, but yes, it takes four to pass. We don't have a positive motion on the table. If we have a positive motion, who knows what the result might be? Maybe we get four votes, in which case I'd go through all four items. But since it was a negative vote yeah, and we have right. a tie, there's not, nothing, Robert's rule says the motion doesn't carry. Yeah, you should. So I need a motion that does carry. That's, you need a motion, what, yeah, the motion I think should be made in the affirmative to pass it it's, uh, and then go through the findings. That's where I was heading, which is why I wasn't all that anxious to go through each Sorry. of the three right now. Go ahead. Okay. I'll back. Now, is there someone that's willing to make a uh, motion on the other side? I'll make a motion that a Variance of uh, 16, uh, I'm looking for a 16 foot variance along the southwest side uh, from Beacon Lane and a variance of, uh, and we don't need a variance on, on the northwest, on, on the southeast side, uh, be, uh, and, a, and a variance along the northwest side uh, of. Uh, what's that? 16 feet uh, from Beacon Lane be granted for the, for the construction of a one-story garage and a, uh, on the northwest side and a, on the northeast side, and a one-story addition along the northwest side be granted on ground that the land cannot yield a reasonable return uh, unless the variance is granted, that the need for the variance is due to the unique uh, uh, circumstances of the property and not the general condition of the neighborhood, that the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the locality, and the hardship is not a result of action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Is there a second? Uh, unless somebody wants to add to our wisdom on item number one, I think we've aired that pretty clearly. Did you want to speak directly to item number three, Joe? That, that was the one you were uh, wanting I've, a specific discussion? Yes. Um, that's the one that I have an issue with, and uh, because of it, I, I feel as though the uh, granting the variance will alter the essential character, and that's why I want to have a separate vote on that. Okay. May I ask a question? Mr. Keneally, please. Um, I the way I understood Mr. Cronin's motion, he's mo moved to 
approve something that wasn't requested. Well, he just went at it from the backwards way. In other words, is, that, uh, is that a permissible uh, motion? Is my question. Oh, uh, can you clarify what what did I? Well, you put it in. You granted. You you worded it differently than the uh, motion directly in front of us, or the proposal directly in front of us, by going at it from the negative numbers and. Uh, Well, when we find the draft worksheet, okay. That is not the draft. Oh, let me find it. Here. Okay. Uh, let me, if, if I may, I'll, I'll withdraw my motion and restate it. Uh, is that acceptable to the second? Uh, Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, move that. Uh, the applicant, Mary Page, be granted a variance of 24 feet from the required 30 foot setback from the front property line of Two Lights Road, a variance of 12 feet from the required 30 feet to construct uh, additions to the existing built uh, single family dwelling, to wit, uh, a single story garage, I like this in the record, uh, on, on the southwest side, on the southeast side, and a single story addition on the northwest side on grounds that the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted, that the need for variance is due to unique circumstances of the property, not to the general conditions in the neighborhood, that the granting of a variance will not alter the essential character of the locality, and the hardship is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Now is there a second? second. Discussion on the motion as worded that way. Thanks, Jack, for bringing that up. Mr. Chairman, um, I'm not clear that the existing motion reflects the amendment to the to the uh, application I I think that that referred to the original setback it's our understanding that the setback lines didn't change uh, when the new application came in or the revised application came in and so that's the the draft order we were given stayed the same and I don't know if that's correct or not but that's my understanding the issue was whether we needed to advertise because it was a, st a substantially different plan before the board. Yeah. And the outcome was that no. we didn't have to re-advertise because we were going, the applicant was not requesting to be closer to either one of the property lines. It doesn't necessarily reflect that, that if they pulled it back, that, 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 that wording reflects that. But. So is, is, the, is the motion as worded now, is that give the applicant what they've asked for in terms of the most recent plan? More than what they asked for. My understanding is that, yeah. Yes, it would give them what, what they asked for. Okay, I just want to make sure that yeah. the motion was for the most recent plans. I hate to belabor the subject, Bob, but could you repeat the setbacks? I, uh, I want to... Let me just do it here. I've got it right in front of me. He, he lost his so it's, uh, oh, oh, yeah, I 24 feet from the required 30 feet on Beacon Lane and 12 feet from the required 30 feet on Two Lights Road. And this was in the draft that you were given at the last meeting and uh, is on the agenda It'd as be well, six by the way. feet from Beacon Lane and 18 feet from Two Lights Road. The plan that I'm looking at shows nine feet in the, on the garage corner. The existing setback is 3.3 feet and, and six feet. Bruce, did, yeah, sorry, did you? Uh, the, the corner of the garage on the plan that I show is nine feet. You can certainly change the measurements on the, on the amendment to reflect this plan. This was simply for advertising, and if you approve the plan, then it's going to be at nine feet anyways. But probably to, to, to make the issue, to clarify the issue, you probably ought to change the figures. Well, I, I'm not going to vote for a six-foot setback on the garage. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at nine. I'm not asking you to do that. Well, that's what I thought I heard. You did hear that. Okay. If that's the motion, then let it be. <clears throat> All right. Well, I, I think if, if the motion is to approve the, the most recent plans that were submitted, it ought to reflect what they're actually asking. It sounds like what the way it's worded now, it's granting them a greater variance than they're a actually asking for. 
Then it would be a variance of 21 feet from the required 30 feet from Beacon Lane and a variance of 12 feet from the required uh, 30 feet from um, um, two lights. Excuse me, wouldn't it be 14 feet? If I'm reading my plan correctly. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Wouldn't it be 14 feet from the two lights? No. 14 feet from Beacon on the addition, nine feet. But the setback will be nine feet on the where the garage right, is. Right, but I always advertise the closest point, and it still has to be referred to back to the plan, especially if there's two additions. I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm not arguing with you. I no, just want to make mean, sure that we're so sometimes voting there's multiple. On what's there's multiple, but the, the, right. the way it's always been handled, that the closest point I see. is advertised, <coughs> and then the plan reflects what okay. the board votes on. Okay. So it's my understanding that the proper motion should, should say variance of 21 feet from Beacon Lane and a variance of 12 feet from Two Lights Road and that the plan itself has been submitted for the actual building locations and that would be what would be required to be built. That's correct. Okay. Does that help you out, Joe? And you could make that amend a motion I'm not quite to reflect sure. the latest plan uh, to make sure that that gets carried through on a recording. I'd be satisfied if we say the right side set back at nine feet, the left side is 14 feet. They're not side, they're not side lines. They're actually front. They're fronts. Front the beacon, front the two lights. No, but, uh, but the, the proposed addition on the left side of the house is 14 feet from Beacon Lane. Okay. Whatever, whatever you want to do. Well, <laughs> I mean, I want to be specific in case there's Repercussions. They won't, they won't get a permit for anything but this plan if the if it's approved. Fine. Uh, and the records will clearly state. If you, can, <laughs> if you can guarantee that, I'm comfortable with that, uh, Bruce. So the motion is as I stated it after all this discussion, and that's okay with Mr. Cronin. Yeah, I'll, okay. I give up at this point. Uh, I don't <laughs> think anybody. Well, I, I between Mr. Hill and Mr. Smith, I think we've got it narrowed down to uh, the right variance language and. Uh, as I said a minute ago, any actual building that might occur should this pass would be based on the plans as well as on the variance approval. Um, and that modification is okay with the second. So, Mr. Chairman, yes. if, if this is going to be legally contended, perhaps I should withdraw the motion and we should restate it. I think just just to dot the I's and cross the T's. Okay. Uh, that's fine with me, but I think, don't think we need to repeat all four uh, things again. You can just say as applies to those four paragraphs, and we'll deal with each one in the vote, okay? So we'll go ahead and repeat it the way you think it's supposed to be. I move that the applicant uh, be granted a variance of, what am I saying, Bruce? Yeah. 21 feet. 21 feet from uh, Beacon Lane and 12 feet from Two Lights Road along the northeast side of the, uh, of the structure and a variance of, same thing as it? 16 feet. 16 feet from Beacon Lane and... Uh, You're okay on the other one. What? You're okay on the other one. Okay. Uh, for the construction of a one-story addition along the northwest side of the structure be granted uh, on the grounds that the uh, four conditions are, are met. Can... Thank you. Second. Uh, now it's been clarified, re-clarified, and distilled. Uh, anybody have any questions about the impact of the motion? If not, discussion on the motion. All those in favor of the motion. One, two, three in favor. Those opposed? Three opposed. The motion doesn't carry. And the, uh, in the absence of four affirmative votes, the uh, motion for a variance can't carry. And uh, therefore, the application is denied. Uh, thank you all for your patience in sitting through and working through all this, and thank you, Mike, for your uh, input. Uh, 
The next item on the agenda is the application, or the appeal, excuse me, of Michael Colello and Margaret Brown Colello, 59 Ocean View Road, tax map U03, lot 58, for a right side property line variance of four feet from the required 10 feet and front property line variance of six feet from the required 20 feet to expand an existing garage. Is there someone representing the Colellos? Yes. We'll take a one minute break. That's your new one. Good evening. Hang on, just, just a minute, Mr. Clello. We, uh, we've been doing this so long that we need a, a little breather for some of our members, so if you, uh, you don't mind. Some of the audience as well. Please let us stretch. Uh, not that I'm aware of, except that mine is just replete with notes, and I'm going to have to go back and reinvent the wheel. So. still certainly habitable as far as that is concerned and they believe that they would be able to uh, contract <coughs> relatively easily to be able to fix that damage and move in. Uh, so they continued with their, their financing uh, being well along the way as it were and they proceeded to close on the house. Uh, the fire occurred on or about early June. Uh, the closing of the house was uh, on or about uh, late July uh, and they uh, obviously not wanting to lose rates being what they are etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, they, went, they went forward with that cognizant of the fact that they were going to have to uh, improve the fire damage. Now, uh, what we're looking at is, and what the Colellos are now looking at, is uh, a series of contractors that they've narrowed down to one in particular who has said, uh, and we have a letter to this fact that I'd like to uh, pass out here in just a moment, uh, that substantiates their claim, that in order to repair this damage, fortunately, let me back up here a bit and say, fortunately, the uh, the overall damage was limited essentially to the garage as a facility and to the beams, unfortunately perhaps, the beams, the support structure uh, on this side of the garage, which is uh, one of the common walls of the existing dwelling, and uh, then the support, and perhaps more importantly, the support structure on top of the garage, which as you can see by some of these photos, uh, supports a small uh, second story deck off of the uh, master bedroom and, and areas above uh, that were also I'll say damaged, quote unquote, in that while the, there was no literal damage to the second story of the structure, the beams that are supporting that uh, were damaged substantially. The contractor has indicated that in order to fix this, that uh, the entire garage, which comes back to, uh, you, can, you can see the, by the hatched areas and the diagrams that you have in front of you, uh, this is the extent of the back of the garage. And what's going to have to happen is that the, uh, the ceiling, the entire ceiling of this garage is going to have to be rolled back, stripped bare, basically, to be able to rebuild that. There's also going to have to be uh, uh, stripping on both sides of the garage as you're looking at it, uh, one to a certain degree, which is going to be uh, effect, uh, affecting also the uh, internal house wall, one of the internal house walls, and then the external wall as well. In order to reconstruct this house based on uh, today's codes, this house is grandfathered <coughs> and both the lot on which it sits and the house itself are uh, you know, legal non-conforming. Uh, in order to conform with uh, current building structures to rebuild this, they're going to have to put in, uh, as opposed to what was there for support and what has subs subsequently been burned, uh, steel I-beam. Uh, uh, steel I-beam is, for those of you who may not be aware, it's, it's literally a big hunk of steel X number of feet long, it uh, looks like the letter I, that's going to be coming across the middle of the uh, garage, off of which all the rest of the support will, will really be laid. Uh, the important thing to consider with I-beam construction is that you've got walls that them, on either side that themselves are going to be able to support that I-beam. Uh, therein lies one of the principal problems as far as uh, the hardships are concerned uh, regarding uh, this request for a variance. What I'd like to do is uh, uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the, the four uh, various uh, portions of the request that we're asking, financial hardship being the first one. Uh, there's going to be a, a fair amount of financial hardship here, primarily because given the I-beam construction, which was not in place before, uh, the 
wall on this side, well, first of all, the, as the garage is, is literally rolled back, uh, getting the I-beam in place is actually going to be relatively simple, relatively in it from a construction standpoint, uh, because there's not going to be anything there to encumber it, and then the rest of the structure is going to be built around or rebuilt around it. Uh, however, there is a potential problem uh, on the outer wall, given that the, the age of the structure and the age of the foundation, and the fact that this foundation is actually set on ledge, with the, the uh, full foundation really only starting at where you can see is the back of the garage and then underneath the rear part of the house, which has nothing to do with our request this evening. But this section, you can see from the photographs, it tends to taper off uh, coming down to what is actually a walkout basement in this area, this uh, section here being flush with grade or level grade. So what we have here is a partial wall, a support wall that's based on a, a chunk of ledge. There is a significant question based on the I-beam construction because obviously it's heavier than what was built decades ago, uh, is the support for the wall, uh, the support wall itself, it's going to end up uh, supporting by a, a steel a single beam, the actual I-beam above our heads. So what is proposed by the contractor in this respect is to uh, actually build out another wall, uh, literally at least back to the point where the rear of the garage would be located. Uh, so as far as building that wall for support, we're literally starting at the ground and kind of building up with the, the new construction, with literally drilling into the ledge, uh, steel reinforcing the concrete that would go on to that, et cetera. Uh, in doing so, what's gonna happen is the, uh, the Kalolos are gonna end up with a garage and a half, basically. Uh, the return based on the amounts that they would put in there, and, and yes, they did realize that, uh, but the return is gonna be such that from a financial perspective, it isn't going to return much because you've got one and a half garages. That's not to say that they wouldn't be able to use that portion of the garage, obviously. But as far as, and I'm going to segue into a second part of this, uh, uh, the argument, as far as the character of the neighborhood is concerned, uh, there are quite a few houses that range from, uh, the garages of which range from a single car garage up to four car garages. Typical in this area is two and, and some three car garages. So as far as that character of the neighborhood is concerned, uh, we think it melds in rather well. Especially given the fact that the garage as it now stands, is, or the space of that garage is slightly larger than your typical one car garage with the, the single door that pops up, et cetera. Uh, this is a little bit larger than that, but it's not even to be construed as a one and a half car garage. What the contractor was proposing is because of the buttressing effect on this side of the house with the internal wall, the support that's already on the wall or in this area, while it is necessary to have to be redone, the support can be redone based on the foundation that exists underneath the house itself here. In this particular section, that buttressing effect does not exist. So the I-beam actually has to be held up uh, by a single individual pole or a series of poles front and back uh, that themselves are going to be resting on a foundation that we want to make sure is secure. Uh, bringing that buttress out a little bit further is going to assist the situation. It's literally almost a flying buttress type of thing, except it's integrated into a house. Uh, if it were limited to uh, the extent of the house right now, uh, it would cause some difficulties because the entirety, nobody really knows for sure what the, ex the, the viability, as it were, of this foundation in this particular section is because it's not built on a full foundation, it's just built on the ledge. The contractor having taken a look at that said, that won't do it. Uh, we really need to expand that out to put another ledge here, excuse me, to put another wall there. So what we're looking for and, and getting into the variance is given that we are coming out uh, anyway with a support wall to what you'll see is actually overlapping uh, some of these steps in the deck, which by the way will be removed. Uh, it would be prudent to be able to have a two-car garage in this area with a simple expansion of an additional four feet to actually bring it out, as you can see right here, which would bring it at its closest point uh, to a little bit more than six feet that the variance request is for, specifically a six-foot variance from the uh, actual easterly sideline over to what uh, the, uh, the outer wall of the proposed garage would actually be. Uh, so uh, as far as the, uh, the hardships are concerned, uh, because of the fire, it was, uh, it, we contend that it was certainly uh, an accident of the previous owner and, and was through certainly probably no fault of hers, no direct fault of hers, certainly no fault of the applicants. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, uh, removal of the, uh, the deck that I had mentioned a little bit earlier, you can see here that uh, the current deck, uh, which was uh, attached to the original, or original uh, uh, house as far as its grandfathered status is concerned, uh, sticks out to within about three feet, small though it is, it does stick out to within about three feet of the existing property line. Uh, 
There's no need to keep that. The Colellos have no intention of doing that. The garage, in fact, would actually replace a good portion of that. So the stairs, as you see them uh, going down to the back area, uh, off of this deck, and the deck itself would be removed. So in one small respect, uh, we're actually uh, not only not exacerbating an existing situation, but we are lessening it to a certain degree by removal of this deck. Uh, obviously, granted that the, uh, the structure itself is, is a bit larger than the deck, as we are removing it and coming further from the from the property line. You can also see that the uh, the driveway, the paved driveway, uh, is already in place. Uh, it's not literally like we're ripping up uh, substantial trees or, or uh, other food landscaping to put it in there. It's already there. It's been there for quite a long time for a second parked car. Um, landscaping. One of the things that the uh, Colellos have indicated is that in order to keep the character of the neighborhood uh, nice, not only for the abutters, but obviously for anybody who's driving by, is to uh, improve the landscaping, particularly on this side, since obviously this is the side that we're most concerned with. What they propose here, and you can see from the pictures that uh, we passed around, uh, there are already some fairly substantial trees there that uh, tend to block some views for the abutters, but not completely. Obviously, there's going to be an expansion, a slight expansion just because of the support wall that's needed. Uh, what we'd like to do is expand it a little bit further, and in order to uh, acquiesce to uh, neighbors' concerns about uh, uh, a structure coming a little bit closer than would normally be allowed under zoning, uh, we, uh, the uh, Colellos and clients have indicated that they would be more than happy uh, perhaps as a condition of approval to be able to put in further landscaping to, uh, to buffer this area, as it were, from uh, any site people driving down the road or from the immediate butters. Uh, I'd like to say that the, uh, going down the criteria, uh, having talked about uh, 9A as far as financial hardships, I'd like to address uh, 9B. We were talking about the uh, need for the variance due to the unique circumstances of the property and not the general conditions of the neighborhood. This is obviously not just a request saying, hey, I'd like a garage. No, I can't put it in there, let's go to the variance board. Uh, this literally is a case of a fire that had occurred before we were uh, involved with the property, and, uh, and then the contractor afterward coming over and stating that, uh, yes, indeed, uh, the entire structure, not just those beams that were damaged, is going to have to be, the entire structure of the garage, that is, is going to have to be redone. Uh, and here's how it would be redone. And he's actually provided us with a letter that I'd like to be able to pass out to you now, if I may. Sure. Just a minute to peruse it. What we have before you is, uh, is a letter by the contractor stating literally the extent of what is going to have to be done as, as far as the repairs. Why don't you go ahead, Mr. Fisher, if you're, or if you. you're done. Uh... Uh, no, I've got a couple of uh, other items. Uh, I'd like to address the 9C on the application, why the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. Touched on that briefly, but the, the character of the neighborhood is such that uh, in the uh, uh, RC zone, the house, the lots are most of the lots are legal non-conforming, meaning they're relatively small. Uh, the houses, uh, with some exceptions, are not grandiose; they all generally uh, meld in rather well. Uh, and the essential character of the neighborhood, as far as the garages is concerned, is again, as we stated earlier, uh, virtually every house uh, in that neighborhood has at least a single car garage. Uh, the preponderance of them have double car garages, uh, some have three, and there's actually one with, uh, with four uh, that's in the immediate vicinity. And then finally, the uh, uh, result of action taken by the owner, this indeed was not, the fire was absolutely totally unseen, was occurred before, or, or uh, unexpected, and occurred before the applicant actually took possession of the house. Given that, I'd love to be able to answer any questions or comments that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Um, I have a couple. Just to make it clear to me, uh, on the drawing you provided, uh, the plan view, uh, you've got a building envelope line around the house? That's correct. Okay. Uh, if the garage were to be built out to the one and a half car size, which I understand you to be saying is what would be necessary <clears throat> for a proper structural support, subject or absent tearing the rest of the house apart to put the support beam on the other side. Uh, 
where would it fall on that fill the envelope line? I'm just looking for a straight line. That's a good indicator. Sure. Would it be inside it or outside? Support if if the support wall if the variance were not granted and they'd have to do a support wall anyway to, to literally support the I beam. Well, it would, yeah. okay, go ahead. It would be just inside of the. It would be basically adjacent to the wall as it stands right now. That would be torn down. The garage uh, uh, itself, the garage surface, would end up having to be redone because tearing down that wall or tearing out that wall would end up chipping up the garage surface and have to be relayed. Uh, but literally, the answer to your question is it would be basically in the area where you see the steps right now. And, uh, but actually my question was, you, you had an alternative that involved an expansion to one and a half car size to basically to make room for the construction support. Is that what you're referring to now? Whether the end, yes. end product of that would, would be de facto a one and a half car garage right. just to make it work? Okay. Yes. Uh, so it would be roughly at the edge of the 10-foot line, about where the stairs are, somewhere along that line? Yes, the support wall would be there. That's correct. Uh, the other question I'm going to have is one you're not going to have me ask, but um, as I said earlier in my comments on the last application, I've been to school on this subject in the last two months and done a lot of homework, and uh, I'm having trouble making a connection between the kind of uh, issue about a yielding a reasonable return uh, and uh, the proposal we've got here. Sure. And you sat through all that discussion, so you're either confused or you understand one way or the other. But Sure. As far as reasonable return is concerned, um, what we're looking at is a garage that has been destroyed to the extent that it has to be rebuilt. And that is really not an argument um, as far as contractors are concerned, as far as the Colellos are concerned. Uh, basically because there's a safety hazard as far as the support of this actual structure is concerned. So what we're looking at is having to expand this structure based on current codes that uh, in and of themselves support I beam or, or basically demand I beam construction uh, along the uh, uh, roof of the garage as it were because of the support of the second story on top of it. I understand that, but at, my, at the risk of stopping you, I just want to, don't want to go back over old territory. I just want to be clear that it's my understanding that that would take it out to a car and a half size, and going out to two car size is really a convenience, as I'm interpreting it, correct me if I'm wrong, which since we're here anyway, we might just as well do the smart thing and make it a more usable structure. Is that yes. fair? I mean, it, yes, that's okay, fair. Okay, now, so now tell me how that gets to the issue of beneficial use and reasonable return and all that stuff we've been talking about endlessly tonight. Okay. Relative to reasonable return, because of the expense that is going to have to go into reconstructing the garage beyond what what would normally be expected to, if the same materials were... Hang on just a second. <laughs> You're making an important point. I don't want it to be missed in the minutes. So. Okay. Start, go back about two sentences and replay if you would. As far as reasonable return is concerned, we're looking, the bottom line is we're looking at, without a variance, we'd be looking at about a one and a half car garage. The amount of expense that would end up going into building that relative to literally starting at the foundation and coming upward would not basically give a, a reasonable return relative to what's going into it because you've got a garage that might have a workbench to it, but you can't get a second car into it. What the Colellos had then asked the contractor, based on the contractor's suggestion, was that if we're doing all this work and we're expanding it slightly, because primarily of the uh, construction that is required for support due to the fire, et cetera, it would be very prudent to go on extra four feet only. Unfortunately, that four feet is within that building setback, and actually come up with a two, a two car garage. The additional expense of which is absolutely minor relative to the one and a half car garage that's going to have to be there anyway. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. Fisher? Mr. Keneally. Um, would it be possible to support that I-beam with a lolly column inside the existing wall that was excavated below that lolly column to make sure it was firmly supported? No, but because of the age of the house, nobody really, as far as stress tests on that foundation is concerned and the viability of the ledge on which it sets, we assume the ledge is about as solid as you're going to get, but we don't know that. And today, so that would literally have to be virtually destroyed, bringing it all the way down to the surface of the ledge, 
do you, in order to find out whether the construction at the time was actually reinforced to the extent that it can hold up that I beam. You don't want to build steel on sand, as it were. So rather than go into that, the proposal was build a new wall at least immediately adjacent to it, if not further out, that would be to standards to guarantee that support. Well, well let me ask you the question. If the, if the variants were denied, um, would it be possible to do something like put a lolly column inside that wall to support an I-beam, drill down through the existing foundation, put new concrete in to support that lolly column? I wouldn't be able to answer that, I, not being the contractor. What I'm trying to do is to identify what the alternatives would be. I'm sorry? I'm trying to identify what the alternative would be if the application as proposed right now were denied. The Colellos, through their either respective contractors or the one they've chosen, would probably have to relook at it and say what's literally involved as far as not building a new wall to support the I beam. And uh, I would probably say that a worst case scenario would be to tear that section of the foundation back all along that sloping ledge mm -hmm. so that you've literally got a, a bared area and then rebuild it in its current footprint. Uh, rather than go to the expense of literally destroying it and then rebuilding it when they do have the room to be able to rebuild it adjacent to it, it meaning the foundation, it would be a lot more prudent to do that uh, economically since we're still in that same particular area. That's just based on contractors saying this would be the easiest way to do it. Other questions for Mr. Fisher? Um, questions Austin. for the code enforcement officer. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Sorry, it is warm in here. Uh, what is there now in your eyes? This is something that you can't see from, street, from the street. Have you inspected this, the fire damage? We have not inspected the fire damage, no. So you don't know what has to be replaced and what has to be rebuilt? No, I do not. Was there a uh, settlement or an adjuster from the insurance company that assessed the damage from the fire? I cannot answer that. Yes. Yeah. And what did the adjuster from the insurance company If you're going to answer that, you're going to have to come up, please, to the microphone. Now I've, have I got Mr. Colello? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Thank yes, you. Yes, I am Mr. Colello. <laughs> yes, there was a, a settlement from the insurance company. And uh, essentially, uh, Mr. Fisher addressed that in his opening comments because the proposed uh, reconstruction of the garage is what the insurance company already settled on, and that is to peel essentially the entire garage apart. They have to take off the entire front. They have to take off the side on, on this side here. And then they have to remove the deck portion, which is actually the roof, and all of the rafters all the way back to within about uh, 24 inches of where the uh, existing wall structure currently is. So essentially what's happening is the portion of the garage that is going to get repaired is going to be completely demolished, essentially. And that was something that the insurance company settled on, and they settled on that with the previous owner's insurance. It had nothing to do with us as renters of that property. And when we closed on the property, our lender held an amount of uh, that settlement in escrow until this work is absolutely uh, reconfigured. It was then in the, in the discussions with the contractor that it was brought up that if they rebuild this and rebuild it to code, that's where we have the problem with the wall supporting it. And I said, hold on, I don't know anything. I want someone who knows what's going on and uh, can argue uh, or, or discuss this uh, stuff in an intelligent fashion, and that's why Mr. Fisher is here on our behalf. I hope I have answered your question. Well, I think so. Thank you. <laughs> the answer was yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Fisher? Uh, yeah, in your... Uh, uh, excuse me, Bob. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm still Joe's kind of wind, asking Joe's anybody. winding up here. So. I thought you were asking anybody. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I guess I'm still kind of confused as to why the beam is going in there, the, the, the I-beam. 
Is that going directly underneath the porch rail now, the existing porch rail? Or is that going back towards the, the wall of the, um, the house? Uh, it's, it's side to side. So it's hold it. it's side to side. It's from approximately midway uh, across the garage, uh, from just the point mm -hmm. of the, the main fire. The mm -hmm. fire started right in here, mm -hmm. and the back of the, uh, toward the back of the limit of the fire is where the beam is going to be coming straight out in this direction. Okay, so it's going on from the inside wall to the outside wall of That's the garage, right. parallel yeah, to, to uh, Ocean View Road. That's correct. And what is directly above it? I'm looking at a deck that's directly above it. Is yes. that what it's what it's supporting? Is the deck above? Uh, well, the garage is actually deep. Yes, is the answer to the question. But there's more to it than that because the portion of the uh, the dwelling that actually comes out onto that deck is actually above a portion of the garage. So okay. the support is also going to that portion of the second story. So we're looking at two by tens that are probably supporting that the front wall of the house. Front wall, side walls, and the house. There are a portion of the house that actually goes into what is the portion of the master bedroom. Okay. What would you guess the the length of that two by ten is from the front of that sloped garage mm -hmm. to what's supporting it right now in the garage? So, in other words, the width of the garage. It's about 17 feet. No, no, not the width of the garage. The depth. You've got from you've got two by tens above the header on the on the door, the garage door. Yes. All right, and they go into the back of the garage. Are yep. they are they 20 feet long, going to the back wall? Well, actually, they, the the uh, supports that are coming in this direction are actually longer than that. But the uh, the portion of the damage that's going to have to be support, uh, redone. No, no, don't, don't confuse me. I'm confused enough. <laughs> you have a clear. You have front of the garage to the rear of the garage. There's absolutely no support underneath it now. You ha you're talking two by tens running from the front of the garage to the rear of the garage. With now that's what I'm trying to find out. They're running parallel to the road. That's correct. That's, that's the issue. Okay, so that's why we have to turn them around and run them. No. No. <laughs> no, they're just, they're basically going to Okay, be so then, then the I-beam that you're talking about is not going parallel to... Yes, it's going parallel to the front of the house. Same directions as the existing beams, but the existing beams are all charged, not all. Then, then how are the floor joists going to run above, above the beam? Uh, they will probably run front to back. Okay, uh, that's, that was what I was getting at. Well, if there wasn't a fire, it would be built according to code now, wouldn't it? Because you're running side to side with two by tens, and you can span 17 feet. Well, you can you can yes. span 17 feet. So you're looking to build. Mr. Fisher and well, if you yes, want to talk with Mr. Clark, yes, one yes. I'm just I'm, I'm just confused, and I tell you, if if we had architectural drawings or something, it it certainly would help me out a lot uh, on this because again, uh, we're talking an area that's affected inside the garage and, and you just can't see it from the exterior, from the road. Um, but basically we're looking to, run, to, to go with a two-car garage, correct the problem, and expand the size of the garage. That's correct. Am, am I correct as a non-expert in this, as Mr. Firstashi is an expert, in saying that the support beam runs from the house to the side, basically to the side of the house, supports the second story, and that's what got damaged, among other things, and that's what you're replacing with a steel beam. Yes. And that steel beam has to be supported on both sides. Yes. And the side we're talking about has to be supported on foundation or a ledger or both. Yes. What, to give Got a it. vertical. Okay. Um, they're changing the, the floor joist system. Right now, they're. Oh, no, don't confuse me. That, no, no. Oh, we got this going down. It's supporting yeah. the second story. That's all I know. And then the joists are going to go off that, right? So. Problem is, I don't know enough, and you know too much. <laughs> I, have, I have another question. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly. Huh. There was a fire. There was a settlement to cover the costs of the repair. The I-beam is the recommended way to do it because of the circumstances on the property as well as the kind of damage. And that repair can be done within the setback. Um, and the variance 
what I'm, what I think I understood from what you said is that the variance is really being requested for the convenience of a second bay in the garage. Am I understanding you correctly? Yes, but it does go beyond that a little bit. Say more. I may elaborate. Go ahead. Getting back to the financial application of this, as far as the building that is going to have to take place in order to bring this building, this house, back to the way it was, essentially, there is going to have to be, or the easiest way to do this, along with being the most appropriate way to do it, uh, from a code's perspective, is to slightly expand the garage as it exists okay. anyway. Which would not require a variance. No, that, that in and of itself would not require a variance. The cost involved in doing that was beyond the original cost. I don't know what exactly the insurance settlement was or the escort amount for that, but it was beyond what was originally believed. When you take a look at the inside of the garage, you can see the charred beams and what have you. Uh, on the surface to a layman, it doesn't look as significant as might as we're presenting it tonight based on what the contractor is saying, looking at that saying, if this were only a garage, we'd support them with the two by ten or we we do the two by tens and you've got it you got a pitched roof, you've got enough to be able to put your car in. The big fact uh, added to that is that we have a, a living area that is above that garage, included with the deck, but also the living area from about this section back, that is also supported by that, that I beam or, or by those supports that are now having to be replaced. Code dictates that the I beam is the safest and most prudent way to be able to replace the system. Given that I, so now we start getting into almost a comedy of errors, except it's not really funny, because if we were just putting up an I beam based on support that's already available, it's done. What we're looking at now, however, is having to tear out a portion, if not all, of the easterly, what is now the easterly side of the house, the garage, in order to rebuild that because of the foundation on which it sits, in order to support that I-beam that's going across, which itself will end up supporting the second story and the roof of the garage. So it keeps on growing and growing and growing. And the contractor's indication was, if we're going to have to do all this from a financial perspective, the extra amount of board feet, basically, that it would take to add the additional four feet to make this a two-car garage is going to be virtually minimal, is going to, is going to be minimal because you're gonna end up having a one and a half plus car garage that only one car is really gonna be able to use. Character of the neighborhood, cost, et cetera, expanded by four feet if you can, and you've got a return based on a two car garage that fits into the character of the neighborhood much more readily. That in essence is the argument. Does that answer, does that answer your question? As much as it can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Uh, anyone else with questions? Now, Bob, you were trying to raise a question earlier, and I... Well, yeah, well, I, I think my question is essentially the same as Anne's. You state why the land in question did not yield the reasonable return. You state strict application of the standards will pose difficulty in reconstructing the garage, which was recently damaged by fire because the original garage was incorporated into the construction of, the old, of an older home. Reconstructing the garage was necessitated internal work to position uh, two portions of the house needed uh, for support to the garage. That would not otherwise be uh, need to be completed to the same extent uh, than if the garage was slightly expanded. Support was then incorporated into the expansion, not the house. The hardship created if this variance is not granted, as the home construction will be substantially affected, whereas any work on the home itself would be minimal if the garage can be expanded and renovation work performed primarily on the garage structure itself. But now you say that that's not the hardship. No. That, that portion of that, if, if the I-beam were not put in there, if, if we didn't do any of the construction here, if, if the house were literally reconstructed exactly the way it is right now, in order to do that, because the support beams that are running in this direction go through the garage and into the house, a lot of the construction that would now be limited based on an I-beam, because I-beam is going to support an awful lot more than the 2x10s are going to, one I-beam versus X number of 2x10s. Uh, those two by tens are going to end up going through, or they're going to end up having to do a lot more work on the internal wall, which is the, actually the support wall for a portion of the dwelling unit, in addition to the garage, than a, a single I beam would do. An I beam is still going to end up going into this portion of the house, albeit slightly. Uh, cutting out the, the methods of support, which are the, uh, uh, the two by tens right now that are all running parallel to the front of the right of way, 
and the litter that we cut out and replaced. And in doing so, you're going to end up going much further into the house, the actual dwelling unit, than you would if the I-beam, which is not the only method of support, but it's by far the primary one, were actually used uh, instead. How is the answer to a short okay, question but, confuses everybody. But then you say in your letter to Bruce, by requesting a variance of four feet to the side setback and five feet from the front, uh, an extension uh, of the current garage face would no longer, uh, would be no closer to the right of way than the present structure. The Colellos would have a much more practical two-car garage. So I'm getting two different messages. One is that you need that, you need a variance for reconstruction to make it economical. And then, but in, but in the letter, you, you need a variance because, well, you might as well get a two-car garage out of this if you're gonna go to all, all the trouble. And my question is, well, what is it? Is your hardship, you need to have the variance for the construction, or is the hardship the lack of a two, the absence of a two-car garage? It's the former, because it's a based on today's codes to be able to put that support system in there. It is much more viable to use the I beam construction than to attempt to reconstruct it the way it originally was. Now wait a minute. In violation Excuse of me. <laughs> I just asked you a question not more than five minutes ago about whether you needed a one and a half car garage configuration to meet the construction needs and that the addition to create a two-car garage was in effect a convenience because you're doing it anyway and you said yes. yes. Now Mr. Cronin is asking me basically the same question and you're saying no so that's why we're having a problem here. Maybe I'm just not misunderstanding or misunderstanding what? the, the question. But <laughs> is it not a combination of both? Do you need a two-car garage in order to make the construction work without digging into the house? Do they need a two-car garage? No. Okay. Is that your answer, Bob? Okay. So the hardship is not the absence of a two-car garage. The hardship is for purposes of construction. For the purposes of construction, you don't need to violate setbacks. So then I'm confused as, well, what are you asking for? You asking for a, a hardship to allow construction or a hardship because you don't have a two-car garage? I, I'm not getting it. All right, this is yeah, can I just intervene again? I'm sorry, uh, Bob, I don't mean to be answering your questions, but again, I'm going back to something you said earlier. It's m my impression that to get, a, to get the foundation that you need to support this garage, you would have to go out to what would effectively create a car and a half garage. And that in itself would require a variance. No. It would not? Well, it would require a variance in this section because... That's my point. Yes. Okay. So the variance is still required as far as the front setback is concerned. As far as the side setback is concerned, ultimately, no, you could build it that way. But you're going to be spending the exact, as far as finances are concerned, almost the same amount of finances are going into a, a one and a half car garage. It's virtually worthless of anything other than one car garage, where in essence, what we're looking for, again, as far as character is concerned, is four feet to be able to have a much more applicable two car garage. Okay, Bob, I, I cut you off, but I just oh, I'll come back to the same point. I thought we'd been over three times. I want to make sure we had it right. That's what the hardship is. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and now I'm seeing the hardship is that uh, insofar as violation of setback is concerned, the hardship that we have that you're asking for variance from the setback from the uh, from the side setback is that. What? That you need? To start with, financially, a great deal of expense is going to have to, regardless of the situation, whether it's just replacing it, period, right now, without going into the variance, or replacing it with, by getting the variance. The financial hardship is essentially the same. It's relatively great, given the amount that it's going to cost to replace the construction of the burn garage. So the gist of the argument is, from a financial, at this point in time, from a financial perspective, if we can get a much more viable return based on getting four feet of space to include a full second car, second bay, as it were, the economic return is going to be far greater because the expense in doing that additional four feet is absolutely minimal relative to the expense that's going to go into having to replace what's there now anyway. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Other questions, too? I, I just wanted to clarify that, that last point about that there would, even if it were just a one and a half car size, that it would still need a variance. I thought I understood that it wouldn't. And as I look at the, 
at the drawing here, there is a current deck. Um, I, I guess this is a, really a question for code officer. Um, would it need a variance? They can they the could front, bring the garage. Front portion would, even though there's an existing deck there now. Yeah. I think it's the front setback. They don't that, do that. Either. But there's a deck not here. The side setback. They need a variance. Any <laughs> any expansion of footprint, even though it may not pull closer, even though there's something that already exists, would would require a, a variance because it would be an expansion of a non-conforming structure. So even if even if you went on a parallel plane with what's existing, but don't go any closer, that additional square footage within the setback would require a variance. But they still can add on to the dotted line and, and without a variance. That's what you're getting at. But there's already a deck there, so isn't bad. But that has nothing to do with it. They could replace the footprint of the deck if That's it didn't meet setback, but they couldn't expand to either side of that no, with the if deck, it didn't meet setback. I read the drawing correctly. The deck comes out so that it's it, joins the front edge of the house or the garage there. That's where the front setback variance is required. Since there's already a deck there, there would be no setback variance required for this one and a half car garage to come out to the front of the house. No, that's not true because there's a small section, uh, maybe a little bit difficult to see on your shaded drawings, but there's a small section that's right behind the existing deck that goes over to where the uh, extrapolation of the setback line is. Uh -huh. That is actually out, or it's within that setback line. So if we're bringing that okay. this section out in the front, then this tiny though it is, you've got a small rectangle right here that works toward the front of the property. It's right in that section right there. You can see Isn't it. that deck currently though? Beg your pardon. Isn't that currently a deck, an existing deck? No, the deck comes down the side and out here, or, or down the side of the house, and then comes. Uh, well, I'm saying, I'm saying the, the section inside the side setback, inside the allowed side setback, but projecting out towards the street, there's currently a deck in that piece, isn't there? Yes, there is, but it, it's, you can see this, uh, if you can see the small section, there's no deck right there where I've just shaded this area. So as far as the front setback is concerned, we would need that variance to be able to come out that far. Because we're, as Mr. Smith had indicated, we're looking at having to build in an area that is within that setback, as far as the front setback is concerned. So the answer to the question is that you would need a variance for the front setback, but not for the side setback, if, uh, if nothing else happened. If nothing else you just happened. had to rebuild it from the ground up. Okay. The minimum that would be required would be that front setback. And, and that's that was a that's what I understood Mr. Smith to say earlier. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions of Mr. Fisher? Okay, thank you, sir. Anyone else who wishes to speak in favor of this application? Thank you, sir. Um, anyone who wishes to speak against or generally about this application except in favor? Yes, sir. Sorry for the late hour. Um, my name is Christopher Stenberg. I'm the resident of 57. And I'm sorry to be speaking in adversary to the thing. Um, I'm talking really for defense of my property in terms of what is going on with the, with the proposed development. I, have, I can't comment on the structural integrity or all those things. Um, I too have a few photos. Excuse me, sir. I'm sorry. I, my head was turned when you came up, and I missed your name. I apologize. It's Stenberg. Can you spell it? 57 Ocean View Road. Can you spell S it for me? S-T-E-N-B-E-R-G. Okay. Thank you. Now my pen's going. Thank you very much. Our concern of right. the, the granting of the variance is that the property is already very close to our side line, which is this side line here, as you can see. Um, and that that would negatively impact on the, our property, that we spend a lot of time in the front, front yard. I imagine that the applicants would want to rebuild the deck that is on top of the garage. And while that might have minimal impact on us, I wonder about the long-term implications of 
granting a setback, uh, sorry, granting an exemption for setback, could that then be built upon again to provide more room upstairs, uh, which would, I think, adversely impact the way our properties are sited. If you have a look at the photos, there's quite a gully in this period, this portion of the thing. So visually, the houses even look more close than they are. Uh, that's really our concern. I think that we came from an inner city neighborhood where people lived very close together. And that's certainly not what the people in this area look for when they're buying houses. I think that could impact them. Thank you, Mr. Stenberg. Uh, before you leave, any questions for, yes, Joe? Um, we have a plan and they've located shrub and trees on our plan. Um, the shrubs and trees, as these are located, are actually all on our property. Yeah, how close are they to the property line? Um, some guess? of them sit very close. I mean, yeah. one of the trees might be in dispute. The property line probably runs through the middle. All right. Um, I can see the photo that was provided by the applicant, and uh, it does kind of uh, act as a nice, a nice buffer in the summertime. Uh, my concern is uh, if they do expand the, the foundation out seven feet or even the, I don't know whether that's three feet or not, in your opinion, would the trees or shrubs be affected by any construction? Um, I'm not sure that the trees would be affected by the construction, but your comment that they are uh, deciduous trees certainly would make it a much more visible structure to us in the wintertime when there was no leaves on. I imagine that during construction they may or might not want to trim some branches or limbs off the trees and obviously, you know, that's something to talk about between them and us. So we have no real problem with trimming the trees that overhang their property. Other questions for Mr. Stenberg? I'm going to look at these first. Seeing none, thank you, sir, very much. Anyone else who wishes to speak on this application? Hi, Mr. Colello again. Um, to my neighbors, I would like to uh, represent to them, first of all, or address the concern that once this structure is uh, rehabbed, or whatever it's called, um, I certainly have no problem with if the variance is granted by the board to have uh, written into that the existing structure, which is our master bedroom over that portion of the garage or the portion of the deck on the garage cannot be added on to in any way. We have no plans or desires to do that whatsoever. And I would make that as a stipulation that nothing else is going to occur, that that front room would not move out over the existing garage. Uh, if, if I may demonstrate something, in reality, I know this is very difficult to do here, but the existing wall that's already there between the side of our house and your yard, if we move the garage out as we're proposing through all of this, the net effect visually is going to be about this much. That's absolutely this much. So all that's going to happen is it's going to get moved out here this much, and then that wall is going to go back down the side. There are two other considerations excuse uh, me, that you might... Sir, excuse me, I'm not interested in us getting in the middle of a negotiation between you and your neighbor. Well, <laughs> I, I, board, I understand. Please. Okay, uh, let me address that to the board. It's okay. this much, okay? And we also intend not to replace... There are two windows in that side wall now that emit light onto that side of the building. We have no plans to put windows on that side so there will be no light emitting into their property in the evening. And as uh, Mr. Fisher pointed out, we have every intention of uh, working with our neighbors to put adequate landscaping and uh, to make every improvement possible so that it uh, abuts up to their property in a, in a reasonable and accommodating fashion. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Cole. I'm losing my voice here. If there's no one else that's going to speak on this application, we'll declare the hearing closed and uh, it's open for discussion for the board.
If someone wishes to make a motion. Mr. Chairman, I would move that the request for a variance um, be granted upon finding that um, the preconditions to grant an added have been met. Uh, referring to the four uh, reasonable return, unique circumstances, yes. uh, essential character, and uh, not a self-created hardship. Right. <clears throat> Is there a second to that motion? No second. Is there an alternative motion? Come on, folks. It's 10 minutes after 10. Let's not get silent now. I'd make a motion, Mr. Chairman, that um, we grant a front property line variance of six feet from the required 20 feet to expand the existing garage to the um, maximum limits of the building envelope um, due to um, the fire that uh, was experienced prior to the Clellos purchasing the property. And um, I think we'd have to stretch the first condition, but um, because, of the, because of the construction process and the necessity of uh, installing the beam, I think it's reasonable to, um, to grant the front setback to allow him to, uh, to maximize the, uh, the garage. So because of this, I will, I will uh, move that we grant it uh, with the four items that uh, uh, stand the test of time. Now, let Second me, the motion. Thank you, Mr. Cronin. Let me just be clear, uh, Joe, you, you're proposing to approve the, uh, I gotta read it here, I'm not reading too well. The frontline property variance is six feet from the required 20 feet to expand an existing garage? Um, yeah, I guess that's how it's been represented to us that. Uh, and that's all you're proposing? Yeah. Okay. Just want to be. I want the record to be very clear. That that would allow them, uh, for the sake of clarification, to expand on the right side of the existing dwelling to the um, maximum width allowed. In the current, the without a variance. Without a side variance. And I heard a second. Is that your understanding of the motion? That's my understanding. Okay. Discussion of that motion now. I seconded the motion on grounds that a 10 foot is not much of a setback. It's hardly any kind of setback. And it's one thing to give somebody four feet uh, when you have a 25 foot setback. But when you're talking about eliminating 40% of, of a setback, then I think that that's, that's an awful lot. That's, that's a burden uh, on, on, on one's neighbor. I think it. Uh, you can't be shown that the, the property can't yield a reasonable return with, unless the variance is granted. Uh, if the applicant had asked straightforward for a variance for a two-car garage uh, and made his case on that basis, uh, maybe the debate, debate would be different, but he essentially asked for the variance for purposes of construction and then and it was sort of an, oh, by the way, as long as we're doing this, uh, let's just go whole hog. And I don't find the arguments in the application persuasive uh, that uh, the, the conditions for variance are, 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 are met by that. Other discussion? I'd just like to state for the record that I, I understood the argument um, to be pretty persuasive that a reasonable return couldn't be obtained um, by just building a one and a half car garage. Uh, and just for the record, I'd like to state that they have to build a one and a half car garage, is my understanding. Mm -hmm. Building a half a car garage is basically throwing money down this drain because nobody has half a car. So what they need to do in order to get any return, they might get a little bit of return, as I said, for room for a workbench, but to get any return, any substantial return on the money that they have to spend because of the damage, it has to be a two-car garage, otherwise they won't realize a substantial uh, return 
Another way of putting that is they will lose um, yeah, be substantially beneficial use of the property. Um, and uh, for their purposes, if, if it's going, the site's effect's going to be denied, I'd like the record to reflect it. But that was the argument I understood to be put forward uh, for the um, hardship. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fristoff. I think in the testimony, testimony it came out that the width of this garage right now is approximately 17 feet, the width of the garage. In the building trades, that's called an oversized one-car garage right now. He's adding on, he's adding on another three feet at the piers to give him a 20 by whatever the depth is. An acceptable two-car garage is 20 by 20. In the last application, we saw a proposal for a 16 by 20 foot garage. So to, to call this a one and a half garage, I think is underestimating the size that's, that's being um, proposed. So I think that this will allow two cars, one car plus storage. So I'm, I'm satisfied and comfortable that the square footage of that garage is adequate in, in today's standards. Uh, for the record, for whatever it's worth, I, I just need to comment that I, I agree with the common sense approach that Mr. LaProte is trying to take here, but I think it's inconsistent with my understanding of, of what we just went through the school on uh, earlier of what substantial beneficial use means. Uh, certainly, there can be substantial beneficial use of this property, this house, uh, if it's fixed properly. And I don't see how you can tie substantial beneficial use on this property to uh, a wider garage uh, than is necessary in order to reconstruct, uh, especially in this specific case when that reconstruction is being paid for by insurance. So. Uh, had the original motion and seconded, I would have voted against it. But um, I'm comfortable voting for this one because I think everything that we're talking about is necessary to have a proper reconstruction. Any other discussion? I, I guess I would support Mr. Fastrash and Mr. Fastrash's assertion based on the fact that a prior house, which was only four years old, had a garage that was 19 feet wide and two doors into it for two cars, and it, it worked. Still have all the fenders. Huh? Any other comments? I, I, I would only yeah. also comment regarding the, the reasonable return um, criteria that um, I, it, this seems to have come to us packaged the way that it is because the uh, repair ended up being more expensive than originally anticipated or um, or paid for by the by the uh, the claim, and I'm comfortable um, denying. Uh, I'm comfortable supporting the. the front six foot variance. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion signify. Any opposed? So proud. Thank you, um, everybody, for sticking through all this. I want to take just two more minutes of your time. Uh, I'd hope we would have more time to discuss this, but I would really plead with you to look at the material that you got around the issue of changing the ordinance so we don't have these kind of problems quite as seriously as we have right now. Uh, I met with the planning board in a workshop a couple of weeks ago. I learned in that hour-long discussion that they had come from no interest in trying to make a change to enthusiastic interest. And part of the reason for that was coming across the opinion, Supreme Court opinion that I included in your packet, the, uh, Buck versus the city of South Portland. Uh, when they saw that, they realized how seriously constraining the law can, the current law and ordinance can be. Uh, so they bought into the need for a change and went on to discuss what can we do to, to get the best change. And we had some discussion about that from our point of view, their point of view. And they then got some opinions from Mike Hill about some of those options. And uh, there now, and, and that material is all in your packet. That's what I'm asking you to take the time to look at if you haven't. 
so that we can give them some feedback if we have any specific issues or objections that we want to be raised. Uh, the uh, two options they came up with were number one, the practical diff having the council adopt the practical difficulty standard. Some of the board members are okay with that. Some are a little uneasy about it because they see it as too much of a gray area kind of uh, grant of authority to the zoning board. Uh, and if you've read that language yourself, it's true. There's probably more there than we have now, and that's the point. <laughs> so I can't. I was having a hard time with that. Uh, so if you don't trust the zoning board, then you don't want to have that ordinance, I guess. Uh, the other option was uh, identifying, well, let me just say first that they went through and uh, Bruce and uh, Maureen, the two people on the staff that were involved in this, went through and did a survey for the planning board of the uh, zoning variances that we've given over the last three years, was it, Bruce? Uh, yeah, pardon me, since 97, yeah, uh, two and a half years, and, um, and presented that in a chart to the uh, to the planning board, which you have in your packet. And there's some inconsistencies in there, meaning that the board has been exercising a lot of discretion. But there is a pattern which shows that a good bit of the problems have occurred in exactly where you'd expect them, districts where you have old houses, older lots, uh, small lots, the kind of problems we were facing tonight. So several of the board members uh, were very enthusiastic about the idea of just going back and changing the setbacks in those identified districts or those that are like those districts that may not have come up very often in, in variances. And that seemed to gain a lot of support because it was very specific, very clear, and the, and the town council could take an action without having to you know, open up a whole kettle of, of fish. And there were even a few people led by Maureen, I think in particular, who suggested the possibility of doing both, that is to say, making those changes, but also going with the practical difficulty uh, ordinance. So that's all I'm gonna say, but I really would appreciate it if you get a moment in the next week or so, please take a look at that material and give me a call at home, if you, or Bruce for that matter, if you have any uh, strong opinions one way or the other, objections, concerns, suggestions uh, as to how we might address this problem, but in the few remaining months of my term here, I hope if nothing else happens, we can get uh, the council to at least hold a hearing and make a decision about this issue. And as I told the planning board, as far as I'm concerned, I'd like to see it change from my personal perspective, but I would at least be satisfied if I were a board member to have the council take this up, look at these options, and say we're happy with what's there now, then I would feel a lot less uncomfortable saying no, 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 no. <laughs> Great. And that's what we're starting to do tonight a little bit. So uh, whatever the outcome, I hope it'll at least end up in the council's lap and the council will be forced to hold a hearing on it and, and uh, then come down with some decision and that may take months, but. Uh, what's the likely timeline for? Well, as I said, it may take months. I, I think I'll be gone by the time the decision is made. Uh, my guess is that uh, the planning board has some rough proposals in front of it now. It'll be at least one meeting, maybe two meetings before they firm it up enough so they're willing to have a hearing on it. And then they'll have to make a recommendation to the council who in turn will have a hearing on it. And you can see with holidays, it's running into January, February and beyond. But at least we've screamed enough that I think we're getting, you know, some reasonably responsive action to it and the outcome is indeterminate, indeterminate but uh, that's, that's all we can ask right now, I guess.